All right. I want to thank everyone for being here, and uh, we are now with the full committee ranking member. The gentleman from California joins us. Uh, we now have the ability to start our hearing. Uh, so I'll, A, I'll, we'll introduce you after my statement and before you start uh, your testimonies. So I'll open with my opening statement. Good morning, Jan. So uh, good morning and welcome to this morning's hearing. Today, it's my hope to learn what steps are being taken to make sports participation safer for all athletes. Every day, parents make choices about whether or not to let their son or let their daughter play soccer or what kind of mouthpiece to buy their son for his first day of Pop Warner football. Unfortunately, it seems like every day we hear about how participation in certain sports can be dangerous. It's easy to understand how what parents see in the news inevitably affects youth participation in sports. Case in point, earlier this year, President Obama said publicly that if he had a son, he wouldn't let him play pro football. Then the First Lady wants us all to move. Seems to conflict. Uh, messages. So, uh, now, we want a better understanding of the innovations being made by sports leagues, equipment manufacturers, and the medical community to make all sports safer. One clear example is the NHL, which has been working hand-in-hand -hand with the NHLPA to make hockey safer. Dating back to 1997, the NHL recognized the dangers of head injuries and took the proactive step of forming a joint concussion committee Additionally, the NHL also established a Department of Player Safety at its headquarters, the first of its kind for any professional league. USA Hockey and USA Football, two organizations that help oversee youth sports in the uh, United States, have followed the lead of their professional counterparts by employing a multi-pronged approach to making participation safer. USA Hockey now requires coaches to complete an online education uh, module specific to the age group they are coaching at, and that includes safety information, concussion education, proper tech, and proper techniques. USA Football, which is endowed by the generosity of the NFL and the NFLPA, was the first national governing body for any sport to participate in the CDC's Heads Up Concussions in Youth Sports. Initiatives and also engaged in providing youth with non-tackling alternatives to develop their skills. Additionally, USA Football's Heads Up Football program encompasses six elements meant to make youth's football safer, including coach education and concussion recognition. Proactive actions like the ones I just mentioned are exactly what parents need in order to be assured that everything possible is being done to keep their child as safe as possible while they're on the field or ice. Researchers have also been hard at work to improve the tools that coaches and doctors have at their disposal when treating an athlete. For example, Dr. Dennis Malfossi, uh, Malfossi Fassi, sorry, Doc, uh, who runs the University of Nebraska's Brains Biology and Behavior Center located inside the Huskers football stadium, has been developing an MRI machine that can be used on game day to assess a head injury. This would allow medical staff to determine if a player has suffered a concussion, how severe the injury is, and if that player is able to return. Equipment manufacturers are also using technology to make innovation changes to helmets, mouth guard, footwear, and other equipment, all in order to reduce injuries. I feel confident saying that given the recent rule changes and the rate which technology is advancing, playing a contact sport today is likely safer than it has been in the past. However, we must accept that there is no silver bullet, no helmet or pad is going to prevent 100% of the injuries 100% of the time. This is why we need to consider a multi-pronged approach aimed at keeping our kids safer while still promoting youth participation. Aimed at keeping our kids safer while still promoting youth participation in sports. This involves listening to how leaders like the NFL, NHL, youth leagues, and top-tier university researchers are partnering to make progress towards making sports safer. These are the types of innovations and paradigm shifts needed to give parents the assurance that all the possible steps are being taken 
to improve the safety of their child on the field. And I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us here today and uh, willing to answer our questions. And I would especially like to thank Dennis Malfizi and Dr. Tim Gay for making the trips from, to Washington, D.C. from Lincoln, Nebraska. And my time is uh, uh, over, so I will recognize the ranking member, the uh, Jan Schakowsky from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very important hearing on improving sports safety. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses on both panels about their perspectives, experiences, proposals about how to make sports safer for everyone from children to professional athlete, athletes. Athletes are continually becoming bigger and faster and stronger, and despite some efforts to make sports safer, much work remains. 300,000 sports-related traumatic brain injuries, injuries occur annually in the, uh, in the United States. Sports are the second leading cause of traumatic brain injury among people aged 15 to 24 years old, second only to motor vehicle accidents. This is a crisis, and one, this subcommittee should do everything in its power to address. We're going to hear today from Ian Heaton, a high school senior who suffered a severe head injury during a lacrosse game in his sophomore year. Despite his re uh, impressive recovery, that hit, later identified as his third head injury, left him with a limited ability to enjoy the types of activities many of us high school students' classmates take for granted. His story should serve as a reminder that youth sports injuries can have, a, have devastating and lasting consequences. And we'll also hear on this panel from Brianna, Brianna Scurry, an Olympic and World Cup soccer champion, a goalie, uh, forced from the field after a career-ending traumatic brain injury almost four years ago. Her struggle to overcome the cognitive, physical, and psychological injuries that follow, followed illustrate that even our sports heroes are vulnerable to the worst sports injuries. Both Ian and Brianna should be commended for their courage, I thank you, Brianna, in, uh, in their recoveries and for their willingness to testify on this critical issue. Dave Dewerson, a pro... Pro Bowl and Super Bowl winning safety and former member of my hometown Chicago Bears tragically committed suicide over, just over three years ago. In doing so, he shot himself in the chest to avoid any impact on his brain, which he asked to have donated to medical research in order to allow scientists to study the impact of the brain trauma he suffered over his 11-year professional career. It was later disclosed that Dewerson suffered from a, quote, moderately advanced, unquote, case of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a disease linked to repeated blows to the head, which can result in memory loss, depression, and dementia. The Heaton and Scurry stories prove that, even, that severe career-ending sports injuries can occur at any level of competition, and the Dewerson case should make it clear to all of us that the impacts of brain trauma go way beyond an athlete's days on the field and be can become some more severe over time. We will also hear today from medical and scientific experts who have studied the impacts of brain injuries on athletes of all ages. We'll hear about the importance of taking athle athletes off the field of play as soon as there is suspicion of a brain injury and keeping them off until they are cleared by a responsible and trained individual. And finally, we'll hear from the NHL, the NFL, and youth hockey and football leagues that are responsible for mitigating traumatic brain injury in their sports. I hope to learn what changes they have implemented and will implement to rules, practice drills, and other aspects of the games that will reduce the risk of brain injury moving forward. I am not advocating for an end to sports as we know it, or maybe not exactly as we know it right now, but I also feel strongly that 300,000 head injuries per year are too many to overlook. We should take reasonable steps to reduce the risk, and I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses. I hope this hearing will help the subcommittee to better understand the safety risks in sports and what we can and should be done, should be done to limit these risks. And I, uh, I yield back. back Thank you me. very much. At this time, recognize the vice chairman of the committee, Mr. Lance of New Jersey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this extremely important hearing. I want to thank Dr. James Johnston, who will be one of the witnesses who uh, uh, came to uh, my office earlier this morning. Thank you, Dr. Johnston. 
Uh, experts generally agree that a concussion can be classified as a brain injury ranging in seriousness from mild to dramatic. The Center for Disease Control states a concussion is caused by a bump, a blow, or a jolt to the head, or a blow to the body that causes the head to move quickly. According to the CDC, uh, the sports that reported the highest number of traumatic brain injuries were bicycling, football, playground activities, basketball, and soccer. From 2010 through 2013, the participation rate of children in youth soccer and football dropped considerably, and some have pointed to the increased risk of TBIs as a result of participating in these sports as a reason for the drop in that participation. The increased spotlight on concussions in sports has resulted in an increased amount of research in brain injuries, as well as research on how to improve sports equipment in order to prevent such injuries from occurring. Collegiate and professional sports leagues have implemented standards and revised their rules in order to decrease the number of brain injury incidents. The NHL, has, as has been indicated, has required its players to wear helmets on the ice, and the NFL instituted new standards for evaluating concussions on the sidelines after the league reported an occurrence of 223 concussions in just over 300 games in the 2010 season. And state and federal governments have also been involved in tightening safety standards. And since 2009, all 50 states in the District of Columbia have adopted laws protecting youth and high school athletes from returning to play too soon after suffering a concussion or a potential concussion. This hearing will focus on what more can be done to prevent brain injuries from occurring in sports. And this is at the youth level, the amateur level, and at the professional level. And I look forward to the testimony of our distinguished panels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have uh, two and a half minutes uh, remaining. Is there any other member on the Republican side who would like uh, to speak with an opening statement? Okay. I yield back to the Especially Missouri. Do they play sports? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on behalf of the Big Ten, I want to welcome Rutgers to the Big Ten at this uh, time. Thank you very much. I Five minutes to the full-ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Decades ago, many thought that head injury was serious only if a player was completely knocked out, unconscious, and or suffered a severe contusion. After frequent painful blows, even a young athlete could continue to play. But we now have strong indications that the effects of repeated brain trauma in sports, even those received during one's youth, can accumulate with consequences that are long-term debilitating and even life-threatening. These consequences can stem from injuries once considered minor, known as subconcussive blows, which may not be accompanied by any immediate adverse symptoms. Serious psychological and emotional d disorders have been documented among former athletes that have suffered repetitive brain trauma. Researchers have a number of times found evidence of the neurodegenerative disease CTE when examining the brain tissue of dozens of deceased former NFL players. New imaging technologies have been able to show the metabolic changes in the brain associated with concussions and subconcussive uh, sub sub blows. Brain injuries in sports can occur in a wide variety of situations, and different athletes' brains may respond differently to an injury. Sports-related brain injury is a complex matter, requires addressing many interconnected issues, so when the title of this hearing suggests we take a multifaceted approach to improve sports safety. I could not agree more. First, we need uh, more neuroscience research. Radiological and longitudinal research methods can lead to earlier, more accurate diagnosis, a better understanding of the risk factors, and maybe uh, a, a treatment, better treatment options for brain injuries. Second, doctors, league associations, coaches, parents, players need to work together to establish health regulations 
game rules, and a sporting culture that reflects the seriousness of brain injury and put the athlete's health first. Third, we must address the health and safety risks associated with the athletic equipment and pursue a better understanding of how this equipment might be improved. Three years ago, uh, Congressman Butterfield and I wrote to then chairman of the time of the subcommittee uh, and full committee chairman calling for hearings about inadequate testing standards, lax reconditioning certifications, economic disparities regarding the safety of football helmets used by millions of American athletes. We're going to touch on some of those issues today, but I believe those issues merit deeper consideration than they're likely to get at today's hearing, and the subcommittee chairman might consider holding a separate hearings on these matters. I think it's valuable that the National Football League is testifying here today given recent and ongoing disputes between the league and its players on this very topic. I believe, however, I believe its players' organization should also testify. Unfortunately, the late notification of the NFL testifying made it difficult for us to secure a player's witness. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is important. I appreciate the subcommittee review of sports-related brain injuries, and I look forward that we are working together with all of us on this issue in the months ahead. Thank you for holding the hearing and look forward to the testimony of the uh, witnesses. Yield back to my time. I have, uh, still have a minute left if a gentleman from Utah wanted to use it. Well, I might just point out that uh, uh, moving physically and conditioning the body is not anywhere near dangerous as subjecting oneself to brain injuries, so I don't think it's yeah. contradictory. Yeah. It's <laughs> interesting, but the, the issue is we want kids to go out and play. We want them to join youth leagues. And we and want sports, but we want to make it as safe as possible. Absolutely. And this is, uh, to use your last 26 seconds, then, uh, this is one of those where Jan and I both agreed was necessary. So this has uh, been a bipartisan effort. So with that, let, uh, let's move on to our witness panel. And I'm going to introduce the entire panel now, and then we'll start with Mr. Daly. Uh, so we are uh, blessed to have Mr. William Daly III, Deputy Commissioner of NHL. Uh, next to him is David Ogren, Executive Director of USA Hockey. Then uh, we have Mr. Jeff Miller, Senior Vice President, Player Health and Safety Policy, National Football League. Thank you very much for being here. And then Scott Hollenbeck, Executive Director, USA Football. Then a face of a brain injury, concussions, multiple concussions within soccer, uh, Bri Brianna uh, Scurry, a former professional goalkeeper, U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. Uh, in the next panel, we'll have Ian, who is the other face of uh, uh, high school level concussions. So uh, with that, Mr. Daly, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Thank you. I would like to thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members for inviting me to testify today regarding the National Hockey League and the proactive steps it has taken to promote the health and safety of the best professional hockey players in the world. As its playing surface is enclosed by boards and glass, making it the only major professional sport with no out of bounds, hockey is a physical game. At the NHL level, is your mic on? It was, yes. Just pull it a little I'll, closer. I'll bring it closer. At the NHL level, our players want it to be physical, and our fans want it to be physical. But importantly, all constituent groups associated with the game also want it to be safe. This objective necessarily includes promoting safe and responsible play in our game, and the National Hockey League, working together with the National Hockey League Players Association, has gone to elaborate lengths to do that and will continue to do so. We are pleased to have this opportunity to share with this subcommittee some of the measures enacted in this pursuit. The National Hockey League was the first major professional sports league to launch a comprehensive league-wide program to evaluate players after they incur head injuries. Beginning in 1997, the NHL NHLPA concussion program has required that all players on all clubs undergo preseason baseline neuropsychological testing. After a player is diagnosed with a concussion, he undergoes post-injury neuropsychological testing, and his pre- and post-injury test results are compared 
to determine when the player uh, is safe to return or, or returns to neurological baseline, which is a relevant determination in the player's ability to safely return to play. Data collected and analyzed pursuant to the NHL NHLPA concussion program confirmed to us early on that neuropsychological testing results had added value and should be taken into account along with player reported symptoms when making return to play decisions. The NHL NHLPA concussion committee also has taken affirmative and proactive steps to issue league-wide protocols regarding the diagnosis, management, and treatment of concussions. Education regarding concussions and, importantly, the issuance of warnings to players relating to the risks of returning to play before the recovery from a prior concussion is complete have been a core component of the NHL NHLPA concussion program since, since its inception. Education is provided regularly to all relevant constituencies in our league, including our players, club personnel, and NHL on-ice officials. In, a, in addition to enforcing existing player rules, uh, playing rules such as charging, cross-checking, and high-sticking, and more stringently penalizing dangerous contact, several new playing rules have been adopted specifically to prohibit contact involving a player's head. Our current rule specifically prohibits any body contact with an opponent's head when the contact is otherwise avoidable and the head is the main point of contact. Changes this season to adopt the hybrid icing rule and modifications to rules regarding fighting have further enhanced player safety. With respect to the fighting issue in particular, while it remains a small part of the game, its role is diminishing. Through 75% of the 2013-14 regular season, 68% of the games played have been completely free of fighting the highest such percentage since 2005-2006. In addition, the number of major penalties assessed for fighting is down 15% from last season and down 31% from the 2009-2010 uh, season. In this important area, it would be the League's intention to raise, discuss, and negotiate any potential play and rule changes regarding fighting directly with the National Hockey League Players Association. Ultimate enforcement of the playing rules through supplementary discipline is in the hands of the Department of Player Safety, the first league department of its kind in professional sports. This department monitors every one of our 1,230 regular season games plus all of our playoff games and assesses every hit, indeed every play, to ensure the league's standards for safety and responsible play are being adhered to. When the department determines that the standard has been violated, supplemental discipline is assessed in the form of a suspension or a fine, and the department creates a video that explains to our players and our fans why the behavior merited punishment. The cumulative effect of these efforts is, has begun to change the culture of the game in a positive way, as we can see on a nightly basis players avoiding dangerous plays and gratuitous contact that they no doubt would have engaged in just a few short years ago. Since the adoption of a mandatory helmet rule in 1979, the NHL together with the NHLPA has continued to impose a series of additional regulations regarding player equipment relating to player safety generally, but also to head injuries more specifically, including most recently uh, a rule adopted prior to the start of this season that mandated the use of face shields by all incoming players, the effect of which should reduce head injuries generally in addition to providing enhanced protection for players' eyes. The NHL also has participated in concussion initiatives that extend beyond the NHL, including its representatives' participation in each of the four international concussion in sport conferences between 2001 and 2012, its support of federal and state legislative initiatives regarding concussions, and the League's support and assistance in the development of concussion educational programs for youth and junior age hockey players. To summarize, while recognizing there is considerable work to be done, the National Hockey League has been and will remain absolutely committed to promoting the safety of its players. We firmly believe it's not only the right thing to do for our players, but it's the right thing to do for our business, both in terms of promoting participation at the youth hockey level and in maximizing interest by fans and consumers of the sport at the professional level. Again, I thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members for your time and invitation to speaking to you this morning. Thank you. Mr. Ogren, you are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's a privilege to be with you today to discuss an issue that is the top priority every day at USA Hockey, and that is the safety of our participants both on and off the ice. We've adapted well to changing environments over time, and we have two particular leaders that we wish to thank 
and who guide a great deal of our decision making. One is Dr. Mike Stewart, our Chief Medical Officer, who is the Head of Sports Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. The other is Dr. Alan A. Scher from St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston, who is also the Chair of our Safety and Protective Equipment Committee. That committee has been in existence at USA Hockey for 40 years, and it's an important group helping to guide our board in making its decisions. We have a risk management committee, which is concerned with the safety of the playing environment and the surrounding area. And in 1999, in cooperation with the U.S. Figure Skating, we began an organization called Serving the American Rinks, or STAR, which is essentially a trade and education organization for ice facilities focusing on a variety of operational aspects, including safety issues in rinks. In terms of the safety of our participants, we believe we can and do positively affect the landscape through three primary areas, education, rules and rules enforcement, and risk management. Education related to safety happens on an ongoing basis at USA Hockey, and we utilize many avenues to communicate. We have, very fortunately, direct electronic communication with every single home, every player, every parent, every official, and every coach in our organization through our database. We are constantly in communication with them with educational bulletins and news. Our coaches have a huge influence in providing a safe and responsible environment, and our coaching education program has long been heralded in the amateur sports world as the gold standard for coaching education. As Congressman Terry referenced, this last year, or excuse me, two seasons ago, we added an online educational module that is age-specific in nature, which also contains critical safety information, including concussion education. Officials obviously play a very important part in how our game is made safe as well, and they receive regular evaluation and education electronically and are sent video clips and also access to our national reporting system, which tracks penalties to help us understand and assess behavior trends. We annually mail posters to every ICE facility in the country to help deliver our messaging, and over the years, those posters have focused on topics including concussion prevention, concussion education, playing rules emphases, and our Heads Up, Don't Duck program, to name a few. As for rules and rules enforcement, we have modified our rules to adapt to the evolving landscape of the game on an ongoing basis, from mouth guard and helmet issues to rules aimed at eliminating dangerous behavior. Another recent modification in USA Hockey came in June of 2011 when our board voted to change the allowable age for body checking in games from the peewee or age 11 and 12 level up to the bantam age group of 13 and 14. This was done despite many voices around the country in opposition to change, which nobody seems to like, but research based on both athlete development and safety guided our board decision. It is worth noting that two years later, Hockey Canada followed our lead. Regarding equipment and its impact on safety, USA Hockey took a significant step in 1978 when it called for the creation of the Hockey Equipment Certification Council, or HEC. HEC's mission is to seek out, evaluate, and select standards and testing procedures for hockey equipment for the purpose of product certification. It's very similar to NOXI, which a lot of you may be familiar with, that the football uses in certifying its helmets. It is a completely independent body made up of attorneys, doctors, engineers, manufacturers, testers, and sports people. It validates the manufacturer's certification that the equipment they produce has been tested and meets the requirements of the most appropriate performance standards, and it's been an important part of our safety story for 35 years. Before closing, I'd like to share with you briefly our newest off-ice safety program called USA Hockey Safe Sport, uh, following the lead of the United States Olympic Committee. This is to protect our participants uh, and, uh, on policies regarding hazing, zero tolerance, locker room supervision, and abuse of any kind. In the early 1990s, we were one of the very first youth sports organizations to require screening of all adults that have regular access to our youth participants. We follow up on 100% of calls we receive around the country of alleged abuse, and our 34 affiliate associations each have a volunteer safe sport coordinator that helps us as boots on the ground to provide the safest possible environment for our participants. Our sport has enjoyed tremendous growth in the last 25 years, more than doubling in the number of youth players that we have. Uh, as we continue to provide opportunities for young people, we know that in doing so, we have the responsibility to make our game as safe as possible and will only continue to grow if we're successful in doing so. Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Miller, you are recognized for your five minutes. Uh, Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, members of the subcommittee, appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning uh, on behalf of the National Football League on an issue of great importance to the League, and I commend the committee for taking up this issue. Um, there is nothing more important to the NFL uh, than the safety of our players. Uh, Commissioner Goodell has stated repeatedly in the past that he spends more time on the health and safety of our sport than any other issue that comes before him. Uh, football has earned a vital place in the rhythm of American life. There are nearly six million kids who play tackle or flag football across our country. Another 1.1 million that play in high school, 75,000 in college. And so whether it's touch games in our backyards at Thanksgiving or games played in our local parks by our kids or Friday night high school games, Saturdays with college, or hopefully plenty of people watching the NFL on Sundays and Mondays and occasionally Thursdays, uh, football plays a significant role in our lives, and we take that popularity seriously. With it comes a great deal of responsibility, uh, and that's one that we embrace. We understand the decisions that we make at our level affect football at all levels and probably far beyond that. And so I appreciate the opportunity to share the NFL's work with the subcommittee on the health and safety of our athletes who play our game. Now, football has always evolved. The rules have always changed, and so I'd like to share with the subcommittee a few examples of that over the last couple of years and the impact that that's had at our level. Um, it's only been a um, couple of years ago that we changed the kickoff line at the NFL, moving it forward five yards. We did that because we had identified the kickoff and the kickoff return as the single most dangerous play in our sport as related to the number of uh, concussions. So by moving it forward five yards, we decreased the number of concussions on that particular play by 40%. That was in the first year alone, and that number has stayed steady in successive years. Uh, in addition, for those of you who are fans, you've seen a greater emphasis on eliminating helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits in our game. You've seen a greater emphasis on eliminating the use of the crown of the helmet in our game. And you've seen fines and suspensions, not to mention penalties as a result of that. And these are the sorts of things that we are looking uh, to do to change the culture of how our sport is played. We've encouraged players to lower their target zones as they tackle. We've emphasized through our coaching that there are better ways to go about what they're doing. And we've seen the results. In the past year alone, between 2012 and 2013, the NFL has seen a decrease in the number of concussions at our level by 13 uh, percent. Decrease in helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits causing concussions has been down 23 percent in one year alone. Now, that's not a victory. That's a trend and one that uh, we find encouraging. But there's more work to be done as we begin to change the culture of the sport as it relates to that. And we've added other uh, protocols um, to our sideline to take care of our players. There's one rule that governs us, and that is that uh, medical concerns will always trump co competitive ones. So we've added un uh, unaffiliated neurotrauma consultants on the sideline. That's a concussion expert in every city to help the team physician identify concussions and treat the players. We've added athletic trainers in sky boxes for the sole purpose of watching the game and calling down to the sideline if they identify an injury, concussive or otherwise to make sure that the player is attended to appropriately. And we've mandated uniform sideline protocols across all 32 of our, our teams so that everybody is working off to the same playbook. And those protocols are based on internationally accepted medical guidelines. We would expect nothing less. And we know as we change the culture of our sport as it relates to health and safety, we have an impact far beyond. And so let me cite two examples of that for the subcommittee. One is our support for USA Football, and you'll, you'll hear from Mr. Holland back in a moment. Uh, their Heads Up program, among their other offerings, are changing the game in our parks and our communities around the country literally as we speak. The popularity of these programs, which I won't steal Scott's thunder on, have been tremendous. And the NFL is a proud supporter of USA Football and will continue to be in all that they do to change the game. And we're, and, and we're proud of his work, particularly. In addition, um, the NFL uh, used, as, used as an inspiration uh, a young child named Zachary Leistet. Uh, who was a 13-year-old youth football player in Washington State uh, several years ago who suffered catastrophic injuries playing his sport. He was returned to play too soon after suffering a concussion. And Zachary still struggles with the challenges that come from that. Uh, his advocates were able to, to pass a youth concussion law in Washington State, which um, our commissioner said uh, we will replicate in all 50 states around this country to make sure that all youth sports, not just football, are played more safely that kids and their coaches are aware of the risks of concussion, that they are removed from play, should it appear that they suffer concussion, and most importantly, not return to play until a medical professional has cleared them. Uh, just this past month, um, we're proud to say that the 50th state passed that law. 
And now the NFL isn't solely responsible for that work, but we're happy to lead and to be in many of these states to get this done. And as my time expires, let me just mention two other quick components. We've been proud to work with the CDC uh, promoting concussion materials that have gone out to millions of kids, posters in locker rooms, uh, and to fund much of, much of their Heads Up program. We've also invested tens of millions of dollars in, in research, uh, $30 million with the NIH, which is the largest grant uh, that the NFL had, had ever given. And the first $12 million of that has, been, has gone out already to study chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, in addition, we're very proud of a $60 million effort we have with General Electric and Under Armour, both to improve the diagnosis and prognosis of concussion by developing better tools, and then secondly, to find better ways to protect against concussion in the first place. These are ongoing issues and ones that we think are going to yield significant successes in a short time. So I apologize for exceeding my limit, Mr. Chairman, but I appreciate the time. Uh, this time, Mr. Hollenbeck, you are recognized for your five minutes. Chairman Terry and members of the committee, Thank you for the invitation, invitation to, testify. to testify. USA, USA football, football creates, creates and directs programs, programs and resources, resources that establish important standards rooted in education for youth and high school football. We stand with experts in medicine, child advocacy, and sport who believe that education changes behavior for the better. This is precisely what we're seeing through our Heads Up Football program, which is already benefiting more than 25 percent of youth football leagues across the country in its first 14 months, and we expect to double that this year. We advance safety through evidence-based studies by independent experts. We also lead fun and dynamic instructional football initiatives for young players, as well as a national non-contact flag football program. More on these and other aspects of our work resides in my written testimony. The remainder of my time will be showing a video of how Heads Up Football High School Pilot Program is improving player safety within the, within the Fairfax County Public School System, which earned high marks from parents, coaches, administrators in its first season. You'll pay close attention to hearing from the athletic directors and the principals and the superintendent of schools on how this program is making a difference. Eyes up. See what you hit. Shot down. Let's, Let's go. Head up. Squeeze. Sink. And. When coaches get to the high school level, I think they assume that everybody who plays knows how to play, and they're going to be under Friday night lights, and everything's going to be great, and it's just like it is on TV, and it's not like that. You're going to get kids that have never played before, and you're going to get coaches, really, that have never coached before. You really need to be able to teach coaches how to coach. Through the Heads Up program, what you do, three pillars, as they say. One, concussion awareness. Two, how to truly properly fit equipment. Finally, here's how we're teaching the ultimate aspect of contact in tackling. This is the basics and the fundamentals. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought as an educator, this was a curriculum for football. Feet, squeeze, sink, and step. It was uh, really a no-brainer to get involved with USA Football and, and the Heads Up program. And they go through a progression of tackling. They're actually learning how to keep their, their head up, not to lead with their helmet. And they're, they're taught that from the, the beginning. It's limited the amount of concussions that we've had this year, uh, basically because we have worked on Heads Up tackling from day one. Squeeze, sink hands, right foot. Running through, sink hands. Squeeze, feet, explode. There you go, head up. Feet, 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 feet. Eyes up, shoot, head up. The coaches have completely bought in and endorsed what we're doing. Come on, get those elbows tight, elbows tight and high. What we really didn't anticipate was how aggressive that the Coaches Association here in Virginia went after it, saw the need to make the game better and safer, and they ran with it. Go heads and eyes up, heads and eyes up. The days of popping the old smelling salt or the ammonia tabs are gone, and, and that's a good thing. Shoot! Heads Up Football has allowed concussions to become a topic of conversation in a positive way. Well, I just think it's standardized everything. It becomes a much more consistent way of teaching the game. This kind of instruction keeps my staff in line. They're seeing a very a distinct improvement and reduction uh, in injury. And I think that says a lot about the program. What this has really done, because we're hands-on with the parents now, we're showing them how the progression goes, we're teaching them the terminology as well, it, it brings a level of comfort to them. I think it's really good that all the coaches are learning proper techniques. 
on how to teach these kids to do it right. I'm so relieved that they're teaching this to these kids at such a young age because I was never taught that. In our family room, Britton will show us, like, demonstrate on his dad, not his yeah. mom, um, the, the technique that he's learning. His coaches not only employ the technique, they keep after the kids and make sure they're doing things correctly, and it shows me that they really care about the kids. I'm not worried about whether he's going to get hurt on the field because I know that his safety is just as important to them as it is to me. Our partnership with USA Football is frankly a vital piece, not only of our football program, but of our athletic program in Fairfax County. Bugs, hit position, rip and shoot, good! It's opened the door because now our lacrosse programs are talking about it, field hockey's talking, everybody is talking, what are we going to do overall in, in a very positive light. We agree with the mission of USA Football, and that is to allow our students to participate in competitive athletics and learn so many wonderful life skills from that experience, but to do it in a way that's healthy. So I can truly look at a parent who has those questions and say, here's what we've done. Here's what Heads Up Football has brought to Fairfax County Public Schools and what we brought to Heads Up Football. It's an awesome, awesome opportunity for coaches and parents and kids and officials and everybody to get on the same page to help kids. If you're an administrator at a high school, you're being asked the question, how are you making our program safer? What are you doing for my kids? We can answer that now. Thank you. Now, Brian, Brian Scurry, I appreciate you being here and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Brian Scurry and I'm 42 years old. I served as a starting goalkeeper for the United States women's national soccer team from the years 1994 to 2008. During that time, I helped lead the team in winning two Olympic gold medals in 1996 Atlanta Games and 2004 Athens and played 173 international games over 15 years for the United States, which is a record among female goalkeepers. In the summer of 1999, my 20 amazing teammates and I captured the hearts of America by beating China in a penalty kick shootout live in front of 90,000 screaming fans at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. I was the one that made the single save during the penalty kicks before Brandy Chastain took off her shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now I'll bet many of you recall exactly where you were at that moment. It was the kind of event that transforms lives forever for the better. My passion and my mission was soccer. My ultimate reward was living my dreams and inspiring the dreams of countless others. Today, I'm here before you to share my new mission with you. My new mission is to provide a new face and voice to those who have had and may suffer the long and difficult recovery of a devastating traumatic brain injury and concussion. My life story reads like a script from Oprah Winfrey's Where Are They Now? Like many of Oprah's guests, I too have been lost in deep dark places with my face in the dirt and have only recently begun to claw my way back to my life. On April 25th, 2010, my life changed forever. During that day, I played a women's professional game against the Philadelphia Independents and Philadelphia, and in that game I suffered a traumatic brain injury that abruptly ended my beloved soccer career. That was nearly four years ago. I struggled with intense piercing headaches that were so bad that by the evening it was all I could do not to cry myself to sleep. I had to take naps on a daily basis just because my sleep was so disrupted. I couldn't concentrate and I was very moody. I felt completely disconnected from everything and everyone. I was anxious and depressed every day and I wondered if I'd ever get better. I recently moved to DC to have bilateral occipital nerve surgery at Georgetown to eliminate severe headaches that plague me daily. Fortunately for me, the surgery appears to have worked. However, I'm still being treated for symptoms such as lack of concentration, balance issues, memory loss, anxiety, and depression. I purposely and intentionally 
had my concussion recovery story documented by media outlets such as the USA Today, the Washington Post, and Brainline.org in order to bring attention and a ray of hope to those suffering from TBI like me. In September, I was alarmed to learn that the number of reported cases of concussion in soccer was second highest in the United States, with only American football having more cases. Additionally, a recent article published in November stated that one of two female youth soccer players will suffer a concussion while playing. I feel the numbers of reported cases are likely understated and didn't designate those who suffered multiple concussions like I have. Statistics like these have solidified my urgency of purpose to shed light on the high frequency of concussions in youth and the devastating emotional toll that prolonged symptoms often cause yet are too frequently dismissed. I sincerely hope that my presence here today will inspire increased awareness, understanding, and assistance to help the thousands of young TBI sufferers across this country. I thank you all for allowing me to give testimony. I am grateful and humbled to have been invited to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that was powerful. So uh, this is our opportunity now. Uh, each of us have five minutes to ask you questions. Uh, so, Ms. Gurry, let me ask you this one. I, too, was shocked to learn that soccer had the second most concussions, which is a really uh, dominant youth sport. Are you seeing changes within soccer, and unlike there's an obvious top-to-bottom connection that we heard from the NHL, and the NFL, is anything like that occurring in soccer? Um, thank you for the question. I, I, too, was very surprised to read that statistic. I think it, it is so high in part because the explosion of players that are playing soccer now in the last 10 years. Um, I am not finding that soccer has completely grasped the alarm or the situation like USA football USA Hockey have. Um, part of the reason I'm here today is to shed light that soccer too should be ins instrumenting different protocol um, like NHL and the NFL are. And hopefully the governing body for soccer, which is US soccer, will start to understand that our great sport is in danger of having too many head injuries and that something does need to be done about it and something needs to be in, in instrumented. And thank you, and, and I think your uh, assessment of the game that you played uh, and winning that championship over China, we all, at least I, remember that one event. Thank uh, you. It was a great game. Uh, now, um, to uh, Mr. Miller, and uh, NFL has taken – I, I think seriously undertake an effort to get the so-called return to play guidelines adopted at all state levels. Can you tell us uh, more about what the guidelines are and how they're developed? Sure, uh, and thank you for the question. The, uh, the Zachary Leistat law, which is the, the model law that was passed out in Washington state, contained three primary elements, the first of which would be that uh, parents and their kids would have to sign off on an education sheet, a notification about the, the risks, signs and symptoms related to concussion before they were allowed to participate. The second um, was that a child who appeared to have suffered a head injury must be removed from play immediately. Uh, in other words, the coaches were asked to act conservatively. And finally, that a licensed uh, medical provider who has a training in the management and evaluation of concussions had to return every child to play. And that part was done in large part to, to eliminate the danger that, was, um, that Zachary faced when he returned to play in the same game too soon. And all these laws are very new. And so I know that, that there are uh, academics who are studying them to see their, their success. But I just know as, as one anecdote in Washington State, the one that had the first one, uh, in the years after the Leistat law was passed, they didn't see a single um, um, brain injury, in other words, a, a, a blood um, uh, blood on the brain of any single football player in the state of Washington. 
and they had normally seen three or four significant brain injuries on an annual basis, and those were eliminated. Now that's anecdotal, and more work needs to be done. And I commend those states who are going back and, and making their laws more strict because they need to be expanded to the youth level. Many of them are high school only. They need to be expanded to recreational spaces so it's not just school-based sports. Uh, and there's more that can be done, and, and there are those that are, that are doing that, and we're happy to work with those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ogren, uh, have you seen um, a demonstrable reduction in concussion incidents at USA Hockey after the implementing new techniques? We do not have the same uh, statistical data that I think Excuse me. Excuse me. We don't have the same statistical data that I think USA Football has invested in, and in fact, we're talking to Daedalus, the same company, to, to do that sort of thing. Um, we have uh, uh, any, any concussions or too many concussions. What we have focused on is research, education, and rules enforcement. Uh, the statement was made uh, in someone's opening remarks regarding the culture of certain sports, and obviously we know that a lot of sports uh, at the youth level suffer from a uh, misplaced, uh, you know, macho attitude. A lot of coaches think they are coaching at the professional level, and they are not. And so changing that culture is very, very important. Uh, we've been very, very strict about return to play rules. Uh, and s as Scott used a phrase earlier this morning that I, I appreciate very much, and we adopt the same thing, when in doubt, sit them out. Um, and I think when you're talking about a grassroots sport, uh, in our case, we've got uh, 350,000 youth players in 2,500 programs, and that equates to about 25,000 teams. One of our big challenges is quality control. You can't get everybody to act the same way or to think the same way. Uh, but we do know, I think because of our emphasis on uh, preventing head injuries and what to do with them, how to recognize them, how to treat them, how to respond to them, and making sure the return to play decision is a medical decision, not a coach's decision, that the number is dropping. Great. Uh, my time is over, and so the ranking member, Jen Schakowsky, you are recognized for your five minutes. Ron, my granddaughter um, has played um, AYSO soccer since she, the first time that she could. Now she's on a traveling team in high school. She's uh, 16, so I'm very concerned about what you're saying, and, and even more concerned now after you're saying that, uh, that soccer actually seems to lag behind other sports, and there's also been studies that have compared the rates of reported concussions for male and female athletes that tend to show that female athletes actually have a higher rate of reported concussions mm -hmm. than male athletes in the, uh, in, in, in the same sports. Um, so what would you say that we, we need to do immediately? I mean, I, I really do worry about her now and, and what, what could happen. Um, so what would your advice be to uh, female athletes, female soccer players, um, and to those who coach and uh, treat them? Um, I, I, too, find that statistic very alarming. Um, I think one of the things that needs to occur with soccer is um, officials and referees, coaches, um, need to take their heads out of the sand a little bit and realize that this is something that is plaguing our sport as well. And um, the video that was played by Mr. Hollenbeck earlier was a fantastic example of where to start. You start with the coaches. You, you teach the coaches the proper way to teach the players how to head um, and do certain drills to make sure that the coaches know how to teach it instead of just letting players run around out there and let the ball head them Instead, teach them how to head the ball and also improve the strength of, of the neck muscles. For females, it seems to be part of the issue is they're not as strong as the male counterparts in heading. And so that needs to occur. And there just needs to be an understanding and an education of what you're looking for when a head injury does occur. Let me ask you a question. Um, I don't know if soccer is the only sport where you quite deliberately use the head. Right. Um, is that... Is that an inherent problem? I, I don't necessarily think it's an inherent problem, okay. but uh, obviously I, I think that scenario when there's a ball in the air and you're going to head that there's something highly probable that could happen. But I think if you teach it properly, you're going to have those head injuries no matter what you do. Just like I said, when you play the sport, you're going to have injuries that happen. 
but I think that certain things that happen during a heading uh, situation isn't the only reason or only time when concussions occur. Mine in particular happened when I was playing in the goal, going for a low ball from my left. The player came in from the right and hit me inside of my head with her knee. Uh -huh. And that has nothing to do with heading no. at all. You know, head, head to knee, head to foot, head to post um, isn't, isn't part of that. Well, I, I, I'd love to get your advice as, as we move forward and uh, anything that I can do outside of this body because I certainly yes. worry about my, my granddaughter. Um, I, I wanted, Mr. Miller, I wanted to ask you uh, a, a question. Um, uh, retired NFL players face some of the most serious health challenges of any sport, um, yet benefits for former players are not on a par with major, major League Baseball or the National Basketball Association, um, despite the fact that the NFL has more than $9 billion in annual revenue. Um, so yes or no, does the NFL yet provide lifetime health insurance for former players who did not play under the current collective bargaining agreement? No. The, the, the players are able to continue their medical coverage when they leave the game, but they do not provide uh, uh, lifetime medical coverage. The, in the most recent collective bargaining agreement with our Players Association, there were in excess of $600 million that went to the players who played pre-1993 and added um, uh, pensions and benefits. All of our programs are collectively bargained with our Players Association, and so I think during each uh, iteration of our collective bargaining agreements, you've seen changes and improvements made, <coughs> excuse me, to the programs for retired players including this year, for example, uh, this past CBA, for example, uh, a neurocognitive program, um, screening program. No, I, I understand, provides, but professional baseball and professional basketball do provide um, lifetime health insurance for former players. And while I understand the NFL's 88 plan, what could be the reason to not provide lifetime health insurance for former players? Well, like I mentioned, all, all of our programs, all of our benefits, and all of the policies are collectively bargained with the Players Association. And so the improvements that we've seen as far as care for retired players, whether they be the 88 plan, as you mentioned, which, which accounts for any player who suffers from a diagnosis of dementia, neurocognitive benefits, which help players, joint and hip replacements, all of those sorts of things are, are improvements and are made available to players uh, should they suffer from those issues, uh, in addition to a number of other practices and programs, including helplines and uh, our Player Care Foundation, the Players Association has additional programs to help players who are in need um, at little or no cost, and those programs exist today. Thank I yield you. back. Mr. Lance, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Miller, the, the changes that you've made in recent years, uh, the rules change, the increased penalties, suspensions for rule violations, reducing full contact practice days, uh, can you share with the committee data that you have uh, that this I hope has had a positive impact on concussion incidents <coughs> that might encourage leaders at other levels of, of football. Uh, absolutely. The, um, and we're happy to share with, with the committee, uh, you know, some greater information than I can offer in my oral testimony. Certainly. But the, um, the, most, the most interesting number from my perspective is when you, when you count up the number, uh, all of the concussions <coughs> that were diagnosed in games and practices, preseason and preseason practices and postseason and postseason uh, practices. You see a 13% decrease year over year. 13% each year? 13% year between 2012 and 13. Very, very good. And the emphasis has been on eliminating the use of the head in the game, uh, specifically helmet to helmet hits, uh, which are a significant cause of the injury. And in those circumstances that we've been able to identify where two helmets collide, uh, we've seen a decrease in the number of concussions uh, by that cause by 23%. <laughs> in the past year. There's a lot more work to be done, and, and those numbers could change year over year. I don't think anybody should rely upon one-year data as, as some sort of conclusion, um, but I'm happy to go into that further with the, with the committee if you'd like to see more of the information. Thank you. I think we would, and um, uh, this is, of course, very helpful, and I hope that the improvements uh, continue. Uh, Mr. Hallenbach, um, I believe your testimony indicated that 15 high schools in 10 districts participate in your pilot program last year and that you are anticipating 500 to 1,000 will participate this fall. And, of course, I would imagine uh, high school football is the football that most of us uh, have experienced, either th through ourselves or through a, a, a child, in, in my case, a son. 
uh, and uh, this is part of the American tradition. Uh, what are your plans for getting more school football programs at the high school level to participate, and what does your outreach entail, and how do schools across the country learn about your program? I think the purpose of this hearing is multifaceted, and one of the purposes, I would hope, is to uh, uh, inform high schools across the country about your program as as the uh, uh, video indicated occurs here next door in Northern Virginia. Thank you. Um, so first of all, one of the common themes we're hearing, of course, is inconsistency. And football probably is the most fragmented of all youth sports, and, and even at the high school level there are significant challenges there. So what we're trying to strive for through this Heads Up Football program is consistent teaching. Consistent teaching of technique, consistent teaching of terminology, and now getting out to these staunchly independent youth programs as well as now high school programs, the good news is they're actually being responsive. They, they're, if it's their superintendents, if there's principals, their athletic directors, they're being asked, as it was mentioned in the video, what are you doing about this? And you, you are doing the asking, or the, the parents and PTAs are doing the asking? It's, it's a combination. We are talking to state associations, high school state associations. We're talking to coaches associations. We're talking directly to coaches. We're working with athletic directors, working with parent groups, national PTAs involved. We are looking at every conceivable channel to communicate this program and the importance of changing behavior. And what I'm sharing is there's been a very positive response. That video by itself, and really the reason I decided to show it, has been incredibly influential. In addition, we now have the Big Ten, the Pac-12, the Big 12, the ACC. We'll eventually have the NCAA. We will have all college conferences involved. Every one of their uh, coaches will be involved with, with PSAs and things of that nature that help influence high school coaches and high school programs to, to embrace the Heads Up Football program and help change behavior. Uh, th thank you. L let me say that if there is one message I wish to leave this morning in, in my five minutes of questioning is that I would hope that all of uh, those involved at your level of football uh, would uh, examine uh, what you are suggesting uh, because, after all, that touches uh, virtually all of the American people, and I commend the panel for its testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lance, and I just editorialized. That's why we have NHL youth hockey, NFL youth football, is because it does seem that it it trickles down. Whatever set at the top, then it gets pushed down to the to the youth, and so uh, that's that was by design. Uh, the gentleman from Utah is now recognized for your five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Terry. I'd, I'd first want to echo something that Mr. Waxman said in his opening statement. It may sound obvious, but I think it's important we acknowledge this is a complicated issue. There's a lot of complexities to this. There's a lot we don't know about brain science. And I think we all could agree that the notion that this is an issue that merits significant investment in research is really something we – and it's beyond even concussions in sports. We got traumatic brain injury in terms of our soldiers in the field. This is a really important issue that is complicated, and we ought to make sure we approach it in a in a thoughtful and and comprehensive way. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for scheduling this hearing today. Um, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Miller, uh, without taking too long, because this is an open-ended question, but could you kind of walk us through the steps as 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 information and research has has brought other has, has brought more knowledge to the NFL? How has the league responded, and how have you positioned yourself on these issues to address the issues of of of, of concussions? And just if you could walk us through some of the history of how it's evolved within your organization. Yeah, uh, happy to do it, and thank you thank you for the question. Uh, I think the the point that that you made that the science evol has evolved on neurological issues, certainly a neurodegenerative disease, is one that, uh, that the, the second panel, where there's a terrific uh, expert lineup, can, can talk to. But we rely on the outside advice of very well-known, well-respected, probably internationally known neuroscientists to advise us as to what the state of the science is and how best to go about changing our game uh, to reflect that. And so that's how we ended up adding, uh, creating a um, a unified concussion protocol and return to play protocol for our sideline. That's how we ended up with additional concussion experts on the sideline. This is based on the advice of outsiders who tell us this is the best way to handle your players, this is the best way to treat the game, and this is if you want a culture of safety, 
this is what you would do, and we followed their advice uh, uh, strictly and meet with them very frequently. Right. And I noticed your, your, uh, your title is Senior Vice President of Health and Safety Policy. Is that position, that, that's got to be a position that, did, that didn't exist 20 years ago, I That bet. did not exist and 20 years ago, and I'm so. proud to be in that role, and it's, uh, it's uh, an exciting one. Um, I know this hearing's on concussions, but since you're here, I've got to ask you one other question that may be a little different topic. I, over the last few years, I've communicated with the NFL about my concerns about the issue of human growth hormone testing, and I know that's something that was raised in the last collective bargaining agreement effort, and there's an agreement to agree later, but that hadn't always come together as much, and I know this is something that's important to the league. Can you give us a, an update on what's going on, on 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 testing for human growth hormone? Sure. We appreciate the question. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have human growth hormone testing right. yet. Uh, the league has been ready, able, willing to pursue it, as you mentioned, since it was agreed upon in the collective bargaining agreement. Unfortunately, our Players Association has thrown up obstacles, um, probably fair to say, from our perspective, excuses for a period of time. And I think the testing goes to the integrity of the game, certainly. It also goes to the health and safety of the sport. Yeah. You don't know where this stuff is coming from. You don't know what, who's giving it to a player or players, and you don't know what they're putting in their bodies. And that's dangerous, and it's also the wrong example to set. And so this is an, this is an, an, uh, an important issue for us and, and one that we're sorry has not gotten accomplished yeah. yet. That's an important issue to me, and that's why I want to raise it. I know that's not this topic, but this hearing, Mr. Chairman, but since he was here, I had to ask the question. No, but if the gentleman will you just yeah, for one sentence. Yeah. I, I think that's why we wanted to have the Players Association here, too, because, uh, you know, that was a pretty strong criticism that you just made. It would be nice to have had the players as well to respond. Uh, well, I'll have to now interject. They were asked, and they declined. Yes, sir. So, so. No. Well, anyway. That's not accurate. I don't they were uh, contacted before yesterday. I want to reclaim my time. And they still one rejected question, it. Though, if I can. I got one more question for you. Um, where are these things going? If, if I, know, I know when you try to crystal ball, it's dangerous because you never know. But where do, you th where do you see things going over the next 5, 10, 20 years in terms of of where technology is going to take us. Do you, do you have some things about looking on the horizon that we can be looking forward to? Yeah, I'll give you a specific example. Um, as part of the scientific research that we entered into with, with uh, GE, the world's leader in diagnostics, we set aside uh, what we call innovation challenges, two $10 million pots of money. The first was to promote new ideas on how to better diagnose concussion. There aren't any objective tests now. They're all subjective analyses. Right. And we came back, we had people from 27 different countries around the world offer uh, ideas. Uh, we eventually rewarded 16 of them so far, biomarkers, blood tests, these sorts of things. And then in addition, we did just completed another challenge <coughs> that goes around protective ideas, how to protect the brain better. We had more than 40,000 people from 110 countries around the world visit the website. Wow. We had people from 19 different countries offer ideas on new protective equipment. And we're reviewing those now. And I think that because there's a lot more attention paid to this, um, and hopefully we're one of the actors that are catalyzing the science, that you're going to see changes in all of these places um, I I relatively soon. Okay. Appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, my time's up, so I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Ms. Gurry, thank you for being here. Uh, that, quite honestly, might have been the only soccer game I've ever watched from top to finish. <laughs> it was Thanks about the time that my, <laughs> my daughter was interested in soccer, so we were watching. No pun uh, intended with the top. <laughs> Top ten. Okay, no pun intended. <laughs> that went over my head. I'm sorry, um, but it, but it, it was it, what a great sporting event, and and it's one of the great moments. And to be part of that is is something special. And and I, I think it was special because uh, it just so much American. It was the youthful. You were underdogs. You were grit, determined, and you brought up Brandy Chastain, not I. It may be a little exuberance, <laughs> but it was. Uh, it was, a, it was a great moment, and I appreciate you doing that and sharing. Um, but when I, I played high school football, that was my claim to, to uh, athletic prowess, I guess, which was it. But we practiced football in August. I remember one time in the south, 90-something degrees, and we're all running water breaks. We run to the water break, and some smart aleck kicks another guy's foot, so he falls, knocks all the water over. So the coach says, well, if you guys don't know how to handle that, we're just not going to have water today. So that was over 30 years ago, and uh, – that would never happen anywhere today. There was actually in Louisville uh, a, a young man who passed away on a football field, and the coach went to trial over it, and turned out he wasn't convicted. But so I think the awareness and uh, you know stuff like what I described in my youth would never happen on a football field anywhere today. Or at least I hope it wouldn't. 
but we still have these injuries, and I, and I think, uh, Mr. Curry, you, you talked about your injury being, it wasn't heading, it wasn't changing tactics, it was just, in soccer, you're wearing cleats and short pants and a shirt, <laughs> and, and somebody hits you in the side of the head with their knee, right. and when you look at, uh, I watch a lot of football, I, of course, they now have uh, targeting, you know, if you're in college football, you're ejected from the game for targeting. But a lot of the injuries you'll see is the quarterback gets knocked down and somebody runs and their knee hits them on the side of the head. And, and I don't know how you change those and how do you deal with that kind of – I know you're trying to do the techniques and tackling and not heading the ball in the right way, but just the incidental things that happen because you're playing a sport that are going 100 miles an hour. Do you have any comments on that, Ms. Curry? Yes, well, thanks for the question. Um, that is uh, very relevant, actually, because my hit – um, when I watched it actually last night again on video, it doesn't seem to be a hit that would have taken me out of the game. As it was, I got hit, and then there was a few minutes later before I actually ended up coming out. Um, wow. there, there really – there wasn't even a foul called, actually. So that's part of the problem, right? Sometimes a hit is a glancing blow, and it doesn't even really seem to be anything that's a big deal, but – I think for me, my main focus is what is done after a hit occurs and to keep children and, and young players off the pitch after a blow occurs to assess them mm -hmm. and then determine whether they're ready to go return the play or not. I think that is the key for me and why I'm speaking out um, about this because I, I've been around the country talking to different organizations and I'm finding that kids are getting concussions five, six, seven in a very short period of time because they're returning to play too soon. And that's where um, I think a lot of the awareness and education can help. Well, thank you. And Mr. Miller with that, I mean, it, it, like you're, and you should do everything you can to stop the head to head and so forth. But it seems, cause they'll play them on TV over and over. This is when they, somebody gets injured and they're out and they'll like a knee of the lineman hits somebody like John Runyon hits the side of somebody else's head. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just incidental, but it, I guess you're right. It's, you can't really prevent that from happening, but it's how you react to how that happens. Is that? Well, I, I think that's, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's right. <coughs> the, um, one of the, the recommendations made by the Fourth International Concussion Conference in, in Zurich was to look at the playing rules of the game. And in our case, we've done that, and I know other sports have done that as well, so you create the best possible situation. Mm -hmm. In a contact sport, there will be injuries, and there will be, uh, you know, hits to the head, and those problems will occur. And so where, they're, where that happens, we want to make sure that we're treating them appropriately, and so that's where the focus shifts from prevention to, to appropriate treatment. Well, thank you. And I'm about out of time. I just want to say, Ms. Curry, is, uh, I was sitting on the edge of the couch leaning and moving as, as they were shooting against you, and hopefully you felt my assistance and were able to, <laughs> to help us both together win one for our team, right? Absolutely. Thank, thank you very you much, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Great, good job. I'm glad to meet you. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Now the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the hearing, and thanks to our panel. Mr. Hallenbeck, I had a quick question about whether the school districts that you've been working with that have been implementing this, has that affected the like liability policies that they maintain as a jurisdiction? In other words, is there any trend towards that may be getting pushed by the insurance industry, for example? So in other words, insurer would say, well, previously I would have provided liability coverage to your school district based on these measures or assurances that the district made with respect to how it's conducting its uh, sports program. But now that there's this uh, program that enhances the safety uh, of, of students and, and young people, uh, we want to see that, that you've implemented that in your, in your district uh, or else we're not going to provide the policy coverage or we're going to charge you a higher premium. I mean, you can look at it the other way. You get a discount off of your premium as a school district because you've implemented these kinds of measures. And I, I ask that because 
I think that increased awareness of some of the risks from these sports uh, injuries um, may lead to pressure in terms of, of liability on school districts. And you'll get some that may choose, based on the premium that gets charged, that to, to push the program out uh, because they don't want the liability that, that comes with it. So I was just curious whether the, your program has, whether you're aware of that kind of effect from the program or more generally aware of kind of how the liability concerns intersect with some of these, these uh, safety efforts that are underway. So thank you for the question. Uh, at the high school level, we're literally on the front, front uh, you know, one yard line marching down the field. Um, and I will mention that we're having very positive conversations with the state of Maryland right now about participating in heads of football across the entire state. Uh, but so we have a lot to do there. We have not seen anything from a liability concern, insurance concern uh, with Fairfax County who works very closely with all their schools and their school district about those issues. But they told us and we checked ourselves, they felt they had the appropriate coverage. However, to your point, at the youth level, uh, we are absolutely seeing uh, insurance, the insurance industry at, at large, and, and really the largest provider of, of casualty and, and uh, liability insurance, stepped forward and actually stated that if youth football leagues participate in the Heads of Football program, they would receive a discounted program and a more comprehensive uh, coverage. So we're absolutely seeing a positive response by the insurance industry, which of course has its merits. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Elgren, do you have is there any uh, insurance liability issues at USA Hockey? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, there are plenty of insurance liabilities. And I think unlike USA Football, for example, which is much more decentralized than are we, our participants are all insured by us as a national organization. So uh, whether it's uh, player accident insurance or whether it's catastrophic insurance, or whether it's liability and even D&O for all of our leagues, all of that is part of what our members pay us a, a membership fee for. Um, uh, the, the, those claims, or those premiums, rather, are obviously based upon uh, the number of claims. And, and so that's another business reason why it's in all of our best interests uh, to try to come up with every technique, every practice, every policy that we possibly can to make our game safer. The number one reason, of course, is the safety of the human beings playing our sport, but there's good business reasons for all of us to want to do everything possible to make the game safer. Thank you. Mr. Kenzinger, you were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your leadership in holding this hearing, and to all of you, thank you for being here and uh, bearing through a bunch of politicians. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate the diverse panel that's gathered here uh, and the important insights you guys are able to provide on the uh, prevalence of concussions in sports. According to the CDC, 175,000 sports-related concussions impact youth athletes each year. And uh, I think today's hearing has been very uh, constructive in helping us to move forward on understanding that and alleviating it. I've read much about the legislative action taken across the United States to pass concussion laws. In my home state of Illinois, uh, similar legislation was passed in 2011 to require that education boards throughout the state work with the Illinois High School Association to adopt guidelines that raise awareness of concussion symptoms and ensure students receive proper treatment before returning to the team. In addition, it's encouraging that professional sports leagues and teams are taking steps to address concussions not only in their own ranks, but also working with colleges and youth leagues to, leagues to bring attention to the issue. Uh, last year, the uh, Chicago Bears Go Bears kicked off a pilot program to provide certified athletic trainers at three high school stadiums during Chicago public school football games. Such high profile initiatives are important to combating this issue and I applaud the Chicago Bears for their leadership. Again, I find these steps to be promising but we're still confronted with staggering numbers of youth being impacted by sports related concussions. I'd like to ask just a, uh, a few questions, maybe not take all five minutes, maybe I will. Let's talk about the equipment issue um, in terms of, I'll ask each of you to respond. Uh, where are we at today in terms of what kind of equipment is being utilized to protect versus maybe where we were a few years ago? Uh, what kind of advances are yet to be made that you think we're on the cusp of making or that we should make? And then is this backed by medical science? Is that, what's, is, is that going into this idea? So, Mr. Daly, I'll start with you, and I guess whatever you want to put into that subject would be great. Well, thank you for the question. Um, 
It's a very important issue, obviously. So the, the, the equipment issue is a very important issue and, and something we're focused on jointly, jointly with our Players Association. We have a, we have a, a protective equipment subcommittee that's part, so part of our Joint Health and Safety uh, Committee. Uh, and so we look at all aspects of, of equipment and how they, particularly as it relates to, to head injuries, how we can improve equipment and perhaps reduce uh, the amount of head injuries we have. We, we've passed uh, some rules over time uh, with respect to uh, some of the equipment we had seen develop over the years with hard padding, uh, both in the shoulder area and the elbow area, and those potentially causing head injuries. Uh, so we've mandated padding over those, uh, of those areas of, of a player's uh, equipment. Uh, the helmet issue is a, uh, is a difficult issue, particularly in hockey, uh, in terms of, of preventing concussion. And one of the things we're looking to work with our manufacturers on is, is research in, in terms of dealing with the rotational forces that can, can cause concussions, particularly in a sport like hockey, uh, and whether uh, a helmet can be designed to deal with those more effectively than it currently does. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr. Ogren. I think Mr. Daly answered the question pretty well for our sport. There's a great deal where we rely on the National Hockey League um, to be the leader, and, and a lot of what they do is of benefit to us in a trickle-down fashion. But as I mentioned in my uh, opening testimony, we do have a Safety and Protective Equipment Committee of 40 years standing. Uh, they do look at a variety of issues. Um, uh, the face mask, for example, is something that is mandatory. Uh, in youth hockey, it is not in the National Hockey League, though the shields for incoming players are now a standard. Um, I, I'm going to have to cut you off just because of time, Mr. That'll Dillon. be fine. Short, uh, football helmets uh, were designed to prevent against uh, skull fractures, and they do a fabulous job of that. They were not designed to protect against concussion. And so that sort of technology or design, I know that the helmet manufacturers are working on it. We're not there yet. And the league is doing what it can to, to inspire that, especially with our partnership with GE and Under Armour, to get new ideas around that. And, and, and the other thing we do is we do regular helmet testing in concert with our friends at the Players Association so that we can inform our players of which helmets are, are working best. And Mr. Hallenbag or Ms. Gurry, you guys? Yeah, I would just trickle-down effect again is important there. And the only thing I'd add is we're working now closely with the Sport and Fitness Industry Association and the new football council, so we're getting insight from them and working together on how we can improve things. Thanks. And Ms. Gurry? Um, as you know, we don't wear equipment in yeah. our sport, but I do want to commend uh, your state for their Illinois Youth Soccer Association it is uh, taking a real um, lead in concussion awareness. I actually just did an event in Chicago just last weekend okay. for the association and talking about concussions. And so your organization is doing a great job. But in terms of equipment for my sport, um, we don't really have anything right now that is widely used, but hopefully in the future there could be something to help. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman from West Virginia is recognized for your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had to slip out for another meeting, and but uh, so I, maybe some of these questions have been asked. But uh, yeah, give, help me out on this a little bit. But one is: is there anything um, um, that we can learn from the Defense Department um, with um, concussion injuries that we're hearing from when we talk to our troops that come back? Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's if there's some way that we're all talking to each other. Um, if you could help out on that. Mr. Uh, Mello? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that question. Uh, we're very proud of a relationship that, that we have fostered over the last couple of years with the U.S. Army in specific. A uh, memorandum of understanding that went back a couple years uh, that covers a variety of different things. We've gotten current and retired players together with, re with returning active service members to talk about cultural issues. What is it about football or what is it about the military that makes it very difficult for somebody to remove themselves? from play, or uh, certainly in the case of the military, from a battle. Uh, we found a great deal of reticence on behalf of both populations, sort of a shared reticence, to remove themselves from their comrades or teammates. And it instills a question as to how you get somebody to talk about, to, to tell their teammate or to tell their, their colleague, hey, you don't look right, you should get off the field. And so we've learned a lot from that. Um, and let me just add uh, briefly as well, we meet regularly with the Army to talk about the research that they're doing from a scientific perspective. We share our agenda, we share the ideas that we have. And they do with us as well. And it's proven to be a very cooperative and beneficial relationship thus far. Okay. The other, um, uh, anyone else want to add to that about our military? Uh, the second question has to, uh, to do with uh, states have workers' compensation programs um, to deal with the 
various disorders and, and injuries. Uh, black lung, from my state, uh, uh, it's, it's treated in a way that people don't have to take legal action to get, get help uh, through the workers' comp program. Is that something that, that would be a benefit here in this program uh, for injuries? Uh, we have a, a, fr a friend of mine has, has uh, spent quite a few years in litigation um, it, with the NFL uh, uh, over this matter and uh, just thinks it, it, it's, it's so, such a cumbersome. And we also have a, uh, a uh, East Coast Hockey League team in our city, and we see some of the injuries and we hear some from some of the players and coaches about that injury. We just, I is there a time that we should have a workers' comp program for the brain injuries? Should that be included in something? Um, so if they I they're not required to follow litigation to get help. If I may, my um, case actually is a workers' comp case. Yeah. Um, I've gone through workers' comp to get the different uh, um, doctors to see different um, techniques that will help me. And that is part of my situation and part of the reason why it's taken so long. Um, because uh, every time something is suggested or recommended, I have to go back to insurance companies to get permission to do it. And sometimes it takes a hearing to get, get everything moved forward. So um, maybe streamlining that somehow would be of great help. And also in your previous question, you talked about how can we help the military uh, service people who have TBIs. For me, um, one of the best things I think would help is um, more of the psychological side and testing depression, anxiety, and panic attacks to make sure that um, each person who comes back from the military who has a TBI gets help in that area, the emotional side of it, not just the physical. That would be very really helpful, I think. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts? Uh, well, it w workers' compensation laws are really different jurisdiction by jurisdiction, including for us in Canada, uh, where professional athletes are specifically excluded in most workers' compensation laws. But it's certainly a mechanism that an increasing number of our former athletes are using uh, in cases where uh, they have debilitating injuries from their playing careers. So, would you? So, what was the what was your recommendation? And you're saying. Yes. Well, we I, I, again, I, looking I, at that or I, I guess what I'd say is I, I, I think it's generally available to our former athletes currently, the workers' compensation protection. I guess there maybe th some of we're hearing is differently from that. That's why I, well, that's why I want to raise it. But thank you for your your your, uh, your comments about that. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Villaracas from Florida. You are recognized thank for you, five Mr. minutes. Uh, Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for uh, holding this very important hearing, and I want to specifically uh, thank uh, Miss uh, Curry, Curry, Curry for really speaking out. I really appreciate it. it makes so much of a difference, and uh, thanks for your sacrifice. And you're going to make a real difference in kids' lives. Uh, I also want to ask. Uh, I want to get back to the protective gear, the helmets, what have you, uh, and uh, how does the the youth and uh, we can ask uh, all of you, how does the youth helmet, the protective gear, compare as far as safety, quality uh, to, to the NFL and, and NHL? I mean, uh, what, what, can you give me an opinion on that? So I, I'm certainly no expert on exactly how that compares. Other, than, I mean, my understanding is there obviously is Noxie, the standard bearer, and, and they set the standards. And certainly all the helmets out there have to pass that standard. And, and I think the manufacturer, if they were sitting here, would say they go above and beyond that. Uh, how it compares to an NFL helmet, I think generally speaking, the youth helmet is lighter, uh, but, but the padding and so forth is, is, is appropriate. I'm not, I don't want to suggest I'm defending them. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact details, but I know, it's, I know it's sufficient based on standards and so forth. Uh, many of the kids, though, I mean, the players, youth players, I mean, by 10 and 11 and 12 years old, they're transitioning into what might be considered, you know, certainly high school or adult helmets. Uh, so they're getting the best available. And the other thing I would add is uh, certainly I do, I am aware that the technology is improving in helmets and shoulder pads and, and football equipment generally. It's definitely improving. Mr. Miller? Sure. Uh, we, we worked in a, on a program with uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, our Players Association, and some others recently that we would put money towards reconditioning helmets, older helmets, for youth leagues. 
certainly leagues that have you know budget constraints as as many do probably don't get around to updating their helmets or what they call reconditioning them frequently enough and so we put a fair amount of money into that program in coordination with the CPSC. I know Scott, uh, USA Football runs an equipment grant program as well. So addressing those needs, we know that a new helmet is better than an old helmet. We know a reconditioned helmet is better one than one that hasn't been. Uh, most important of all is that those that, that coaches learn how to fit the helmets. That's going to be the number one safety uh, piece to the equation as it relates to kids. And so we're aware of these issues, and we're trying to, to, trying to make a difference there as well. So your, in your opinion, uh, the youth helmet or the high school yeah, helmet is not as safe as the NFL, but you do have a program uh, to help. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know about the comparative. The quality might not be as good. Yeah, I, I don't know about the comparative safety of the helmets. Okay. I, I suppose that's probably a question. That Can I talk to you yeah. about this of course. particular program? No question. Because I know of, uh, parents uh, where the kids uh, play high school football, uh, and, uh, and the parent will purchase a better quality helmet for the child and you know I'm concerned about the, the kids that don't have the you know the parents don't have the money uh, yeah. to purchase that and it's so very important so I would appreciate working Happy with to. you on this a every kid deserves the, the proper equipment there's an, an existing uh, grant program out there I'd like to hear about it and then also uh, if I uh, it, can I hear from the the hockey uh, hockey as well and sure at, at the youth level um, I, I think the helmets are just as good as the National Hockey League the only difference is size they have to be certified by the Hockey Equipment Certification Council. There's a three-year expiration date on every helmet. You can't use a helmet that's more than three years old. Very good. Um, NHL one. Yeah, no, I, I would echo, I would first echo Mr. Miller's comments that, you know, uh, helmets in our sport as well uh, are principally designed to, to prevent skull fractures. They're not principally designed to prevent concussions. So, and, and sometimes they can disperse force in a way that does prevent concussion, but that's not their principal purpose. Uh, we also have uh, uh, regulations uh, that we make available to our equipment managers and our players with respect to frequent replacing of helmets. Uh, so each, uh, each player is, uh, is, is essentially asked to replace uh, his home helmet at least once a season uh, and his, his, his road team helmet at least two, two times a season because we're worried about aging effects uh, and degradation that, that uh, accompanies travel uh, requirements for our team. So. Uh, so f frequent replacing of helmets is a priority for our, our league as well. Are the coaches educated? I mean, do they know uh, which, which size fits the, the child? Have they been uh, briefed on those particular issues? Because that's so very important. Youth, youth sports, uh, hockey, and, and, and football. They are. I, I agree with Mr. Miller that it is a, um, uh, it's a big difference maker you know, in, in, in the helmet doing its job. But it's a pretty fundamental part of, of uh, what a coach has to do to make sure the players on his team all have the proper equipment and are wearing it in the right way. Very good. Yeah. And Very I would just like add, comment. yes, I would just add that it, that's, a, that's a cornerstone of our heads of football program, Very equipment good. fitting, because frankly, at the youth and high school level, we found that don't know how to properly fit equipment. So it's a very important element within the program. Thank you very much for including that. Uh, as far as the, the you know, the, the youth, uh, of course, the NFL, hockey stars, what have you, baseball, basketball, uh, they're looked up to by our, our children, as you know. Uh, do y'all have programs where you can speak, that speak, you know, maybe go to the schools, the football players, what have you, professional football players, go to the schools and speak on these particular issues? Yeah, one of, one of the, and, and our, uh, our, our active players are, are by and large terrific at, at, at this topic. Um, one of the elements we included uh, or offered up to USA Football as part of their Heads of Football program was actually what we call an ambassador. So for leagues that were early adopters of the program, they would get visits and consultation with a retired NFL player. Uh, we're trying to encourage our clubs with great success, by the way. They've really um, done a terrific job of embracing in their communities the youth leagues and others and so that they're around the facility more, that they, that they interact with coaches, trainers, uh, and certainly players, which obviously bring the star quality of it brings attention to, to it, which was part of the motivation in the first place. But we have found our retired players um, thrilled to, to participate and really active and helpful uh, to, the, to the end that you, you right. suggest. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, so if you, any of you want to answer that question, you'll have to do it by writing. <laughs> uh, and brings me to the point that, uh, oh, you have a question. I'm sorry. Uh, recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Island. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry I'm late. I was at another hearing downstairs. Um, 
Mr. Miller, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, many tens of thousands of helmets are used every year that are more than 10 years old. <coughs> I understand that the NFL participated in a program initiated by the Consumer P Product Safety Commission by donating money that would go towards new helmets for youth football players in low-income communities. And I really want to commend the uh, uh, NFL for this initiative. <coughs> of course, it's going to cost a lot more money to get to the point where virtually all kids around the country who play football no longer wear old helmets that are likely degraded or obsolete. I'm pleased to know of your donation to the CPSC initiative because it strikes me as an acknowledgement that wearing an old helmet when playing football is not advisable, a statement from the NFL that would be very influential. We've also heard that reconditioning those under 10 years old is important to ensure the proper foam density and that other degraded parts of the helmet are replaced. So I wanted to ask you the following questions for a yes or no answer. We realize, I guess that's why I'm sitting in, doc in <laughs> Chairman Dingle's seat. Um, we realize that many issues are subject <laughs> to negotiations, but can the NFL commit to supporting prohibiting helmets on the field that are over 10 years old? In, uh, in the youth space? You're, you're talking specifically about youth football prohibiting helmets that are, that yes. are older than 10 years there. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I plead uh, not enough familiarity with the issue. I know that there are a couple of states who have taken that step, and we'd be happy to work with you uh, to pursue it. The, the prime place that, as you mentioned, that we work with in, in promoting uh, newer well, refurbished well helmets is with the CPSC or through USA Football, who has a grant program as well. But um, So the first question is committing to supporting prohibiting helmets on the field that are over 10 years old. Could you commit to supporting a policy position that helmets more than 10 years old present an unacceptable safety risk? That's the pot position that's taken by most of the helmet industry. If that's the if that's the position of the helmet industry, I see no reason why we would have a concern with that. That sounds appropriate. Riddell and Adams strongly recommend that their their helmet should be discarded after ten years. Can the NFL commit to supporting a policy position re recommending that helmets be discarded after ten years? We would certainly support the helmet companies and and how they how they advise people to use their products. We've uh, we've also heard stories of players using beat up lucky college helmets or adjusting their helmets by perhaps removing some padding uh, um, hel in the helmets for f comfort. Will the NFL commit to support a policy position that all players should wear helmets that are reconditioned properly? Well, all, all of our players have, have choices in which helmets they use as long as they pass uh, the no NOXIE, the certification body standards. And so that's something that's uh, a point of discussion with our players' association. And players have to use helmets that pass the standard. So I and that we're happy that to they were that. reconditioned pr properly and they had the a appropriate padding. Sure, the, the, the NFL players' helmets are reconditioned regularly, is my understanding. And our equipment managers work with the players to make sure that their their helmets are in in good working order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes.
Uh, we start having our witnesses take their respective places. Okay, if we could have everybody take their seats. And as you are settling in, this is uh, 
pun intended, the more heady part of our hearing today where we're dealing with neuroscience and medical research and physics. Well, physics when Dr. Gay gets, uh, arrives. Uh, so, uh, panel two, uh, I will introduce you from Mr. Cleland on down. Mr. Cleland is the Assistant Director, Division of Advertising Practices at the Federal Trade Commission. We have Ian Heaton, Student Ambassador for the National Council on Youth Sports Safety. And if I might editorialize, uh, I think uh, Jan did a great job of juxtaposing a face of TBI and concussions on each panel. And Ian, as a high school lacrosse player, is that face for the uh, more scientific-based panel. So thank you, Ian, for taking your day away from school. I know how tough it is to be pulled out of school uh, and come testify before Congress, just like a normal high school student. <laughs> then Dr. Robert Graham, Chair, Committee on Sports-Related Concussion in Youth at the Institutes of Medicine. Uh, Dennis Malfis, Ph.D., Director, Center for Brain Biology and Behavior at the famed University of Nebraska. Then, uh, thank you, Doctor. Then, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. James Johnston, Assistant Professor, Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, star of screen, Dr. Tim Gay, Ph.D., Professor of Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics, University of Nebraska. Gerald Joye, Joya, Ph.D., Division of Chief Neuropsychology, Children's Medical Hospital. Uh, and uh, not quite up to the level of University of Nebraska, we have the Harvard Medical School. That's just humor. <laughs> uh -huh. Professor of, yeah. <laughs> Professor of Psychiatry and Radiology at the uh, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Thank you for being here for a very impressive and esteemed uh, panel of scientists and experts. And Mr. Cleland, uh, we will start. You are now recognized for your five minutes. Yeah, the green light is on. Can you, is it better? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Richard Cleland. I'm an assistant director for the Division of Advertising Practices at the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to provide information about the actions we've taken over the past few years with respect to concussion protection claims. Claims that implicate serious health concerns, especially those potentially affecting children and young adults, are always a high priority at the Commission. The Commission strives to protect consumers using a variety of means. Uh, first and foremost, the agency enforces Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which prohibits deceptive and unfair acts or practices. In interpreting Section 5, the Commission has determined that a representation, omission, or practice is deceptive if it is likely to mislead a consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances and it is material, that is, it is likely to affect the consumer's conduct or choice decision about a particular product at issue. The Commission does not test products for safety and efficacy. It does, however, require that an advertiser have a reasonable basis for all objective claims conveyed in an ad. The Commission examines specific facts of the case to determine the type of evidence that will be sufficient to support a claim. However, when the claims involve safety and sa uh, health and safety, the advertiser generally must have competent and reliable scientific evidence substantiating that claim. As awareness of the dangers of concussion has grown, sporting goods manufacturers have begun making concussion protection claims for an increasing array of products. These include football helmets and mouth guards, but also include other types of products. In August 2012, the Commission announced a settlement with the makers of brain pad mouth guards. The Commission's complaint alleged that brain pad lacked a reasonable basis for its claims that the mouth guards reduce the risk of concussions, particularly those caused by lower jaw impacts. 
and falsely claimed that scientific evidence proved that the mouth guards did so. The final order in that case prohibits BrainPad from representing that any mouth guard or other equipment designed to protect the brain from injury will reduce the risk of concussions unless the claim is true and substantiated by competent and reliable scientific evidence. In addition, the Commission sent out warning letters to nearly 20 other manufacturers of sports equipment, advising them of the brain pad settlement and warning them that they might, might be making deceptive concussion claims about their products. The FTC has monitored the, what, these websites uh, and is working with them as necessary to modify their claims uh, on their sites and in some cases ensure that the necessary, necessary disclosures are clear and prominent. Commission staff continues to survey the marketplace for concussion reduction claims and alert advertisers who are making potentially problematic claims of our concerns and of the need for appropriate substantiation for such claims. Co commission staff also investigated concussion reduction claims made by three major manufacturers of football helmets, uh, Riddell Sports Incorporated, Schutz uh, Sport Incorporated, and Zenith LLC. In these matters, the staff determined to close the investigations without taking formal action, by which time all three companies had discontinued the potentially deceptive claims or had agreed to do so. Those, those cases are discussed in greater detail in the Commission's written testimony. The Commission plans to continue monitoring the market for products making these claims to ensure that advertisers do not mislead consumers about the product's capabilities or the science underlying them. At the same time, we are, we are mindful of the need to tread carefully so as to avoid inadvertently chilling research or impeding the development of new technologies and products that truly provide concussion protection. The Commission appreciates the Committee's interest in this very important area, as well as the opportunity to discuss our agency's effort to ensure that the information being provided to consumers, in particular, to the parents of young athletes is truthful and not misleading. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ian, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to share my story today. My name is Ian Heaton, and I am here as a student ambassador for the National Council on Youth Sports Safety. I am also a senior at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School in Bethesda, Maryland. I was a sophomore playing in a high school off-season lacrosse game when I sustained a serious head injury which that we later discovered was my third concussion. Until then, I did not appreciate what a great life I was living. I got good grades and challenging classes, played high school lacrosse, was working on my second degree black belt in martial arts, had a job I loved teaching Taekwondo, performed with my school's jazz ensemble and combo, and had an active social life. It was over in a split second. My concussion left me with only 5% of normal cognitive activity and I was almost immobilized. I've spent two and a half years recovering and at times have ever wondered if I would ever get that life back. It has been a long, slow process. At first, all I wanted to do was sleep. Noise, light, and even moving my eyes caused headaches and nausea. I was enrolled in the Children's Hospital SCORE program that Dr. Joa will describe later. Uh, where I received ongoing cognitive evaluation and treatment for, for symptoms. After missing school for two weeks, I tried to go back but was unable to function. The frustration of trying to focus on lectures, moving through the pandemonium of the halls, and the constant sensory bombardment made a normal school day impossible. However, through my school, I eventually enrolled in a home teaching program, and with the help of my tutors and family, was able to complete my semester co coursework at my own pace. I finally returned to school in December, but was still far from recovered. I have spent the two and a half years since my concussion slowly regaining organizational skills, the ability to learn and retain information, and most important, my personality. During this time, my friends and family learned to recognize the signs that meant I needed to shut down from any kind of mental or physical activity for a day or two. These relapses were particularly tough and discouraging, and meant that I had to drop a class and miss a band trip to Chicago, among other things. The worst was when I had a crash and could not go to my first concert, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The friend I gave my ticket to really owes me. 
Uh, the spring after my injury, I was medically cleared to return to sports, but made the hard decision that I would not play lacrosse or other intensive sports again. I know that a lot of people recover and return to play, but the possibility of another concussion means I could lose everything again, just like that, and not come back the next time. I now look at my recovery as something that has made me stronger, but I know that I am one of the very lucky ones who had the resources and medical attention I needed and a school system that is aware of concussion issues and provided an unusually high level of support. It is not over yet. My recovery continues, but my outlook is positive and I'm excited about the future as I prepare for college. I'm thinking about becoming a high school math or science teacher. I now have a hard question. What can be done to create a safer sports environment and to ensure that when injuries do occur, the support, the support for full recovery is available? We can't just do away with youth sports. I've played baseball, travel soccer, and league and high school lacrosse, and being on those teams not only gave me a healthy outlet, it taught me important lessons. Sports are one of the best parts of growing up and becoming a strong adult. They teach us that if we work hard, we will become skilled and proud of our accomplishments. They teach us how to be part of a team, to have pride in success, and learn the lessons of defeat. They teach us that sometimes we have to quit thinking of ourselves and think of the good of the team. For these and many other reasons, I hope that steps can be taken so that future young athletes have these opportunities. There are two important things I think would make a big difference. The first is to change the cultures of hitting hard to take out a good opponent rather than playing to win through skill, and brushing off injuries to get back into the game. While better equipment may decrease injuries, it is coaches, parents, and players who have to back away from the need to win at all costs, or fear the losing status on the team went out for an injury, to be willing to recover fully before returning to play. It will take a while, but if, but if youth and professional sports are to survive, these attitudes must be embraced. Second, when injuries do occur, we must have a way for qualified personnel to quickly assess injuries on the field, have players get immediate attention, and then support recovery through schools and medical institutions. These are the things that were done for me and are the reason I've been able to return to normal. As a student ambassador for the NCYSS, the message I hope to give young athletes is this. You think you are invulnerable. You take risks and brush off injuries because you think you will recover quickly from anything that happens. You won't. Don't be a hero, especially when it comes to your head. It's the only brain you'll have, and your personality is who you are. It's not worth a couple of seasons of glories to lose the opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Graham, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Shikoski. Uh, my name is Bob Graham. I served as the chair of the Institute of Medicine Sports-Related Concussions and Youth Study. Uh, as you have my testimony before you, and I think copies of the study itself, I will just try to take these minutes just to give you a summary. Uh, the Institute of Medicine is part of the National Academy of Sciences, which is chartered by the Congress to provide advice to the Congress and to the executive on various scientific issues. Uh, we were specifically uh, impaneled to look at the evidence about the causes and consequences of concussion in youth and military the state of concussion diagnosis and management, the role of protective equipment, and sports regulation. Uh, we had 17 members on our committee. We worked in 2013. Dr. Mofis, who will follow me, was a member of that committee. Uh, and we came with, uh, with just six recommendations. Uh, the first was that the CDC needed to establish a better mechanism for national surveillance to comprehensively capture the incidence of concussions. You've heard uh, a number of figures this morning about the uh, concussions in one sport or another. Uh, we know what the incidence is where they are measured. We do not know what the incidence is in sports where they are not measured or where they are not more closely watched. We need to have that baseline to really know the degree to which we have a problem and as we take corrective measures, the success rate that we are having in making an impact on decreasing the incidence of concussion. 
So number one, we need better surveillance. We need better epidemiology. Uh, number two, a uh, couple of recommendations related to research. Uh, we need the NIH and the DOD to look more specifically at what metrics and markers are for concussions. Uh, how do you assess the severity of a concussion? Uh, how do you find uh, uh, diagnostically whether or not an individual has had a concussion? Right now, it's largely based upon observation and self-report, but are there some physiologic markers that could be used to give us better documentation that a concussion has actually occurred, some, perhaps without the individual knowing it or without it being observed? Uh, secondly, we need the NIH and DOD to look at more carefully, longitudinally, at the short and long-term consequences of concussions. We've heard uh, testimony in this panel, a prior panel, individuals that have had one or more concussions. What are the long-term sequelae of an individual or multiple concussions? Uh, that gives us some sense about not only, again, the epidemiology of the problem that we're dealing with, but what treatment and interventions may be and what rehabilitation may be. Uh, fourth recommendation was to the NCAA and the National Federation of State and High School Associations to look at age-appropriate techniques and roles and playing standards. And again, your first panel talked a little bit about that, mostly at the professional level, but can you change the manner in which uh, the sport is practiced and the, uh, the rules of engagement in the sport that may decrease the risk of concussion. There was one example from the hockey uh, area where they had changed the level where they allowed body checking and felt that they saw a decrease in concussion. Uh, we think that that same sort of examination should take place at the college and the uh, uh, elementary and high school level to see whether or not they can have the same impact. Uh, the fifth recommendation had to do with uh, a better study of what the role may be for protective equipment. And again, your first panel talked a lot about that. Uh, the committee had a number of questions about that. Uh, our committee found that there was very little evidence that helmets uh, protect against concussions. Uh, and there's a lot of data in that, and I think some of the other panelists will be talking about that. You may come away with an equivalence degree in physics uh, this morning. Uh, it, it's a complicated issue. Uh, but there are a number of uh, suggestions. Uh, you know, we certainly did not recommend you don't use helmets. They do protect against uh, bone injury and, uh, and soft tissue injury. But the suggestion that a helmet itself may decrease the incidence of concussion, uh, the evidence does not appear to be there to us. And we think that the NIH and DOD, again, have a role in looking more specifically at what we may be able to do related to the bio biomechanical determinants uh, and protection against concussions. And then our final recommendation had to do with the topic which has come up uh, frequently, and that is changing the culture and the way concussions are viewed. Uh, this is a significant injury. Uh, athletes need to be encouraged to report, uh, to take themselves out of the game. Coaches and parents need to be encouraged to say, for your own protection, you need to be removed and give yourself a chance for recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Malfis, you are recognized for your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity. Uh, if we could have the uh, slides. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so I think the uh, earlier group uh, talked about a number of if you can go ahead and put that on PowerPoint. Um, a number of uh, sports where the uh, rate of concussion is particularly high. Uh, there are, of course, differences in rates for men and women. And uh, uh, Dr. G uh, Gay will talk about some of that in terms of weaknesses of women's necks relative to their um, uh, men's uh, necks and how that puts them perhaps more at risk for uh, uh, concussion. Next slide. Concussion uh, accounts for, in the United States, roughly about 75% of uh, traumatic brain injuries. It is a brain injury. There is damage to the brain. Uh, there's a discussion about whether it's permanent or uh, temporary. In the military, the rate is 77%. So it turns out that youth sports are a good model for also looking at 
um, concussion in terms of the military. And in fact, most of the military concussions occur in situations most like they do with the, uh, the rest of Americans. Some certainly occur in uh, theater, uh, but uh, majority occur outside of theater in uh, accidents like we uh, all are sort of prone to experience. Uh, next slide. If we look at uh, brain injuries overall, uh, there are estimates, uh, these are all estimates, of course, and they vary across the, the literature, uh, but we're looking at somewhere probably in the neighborhood of about 4 million uh, uh, tronic brain injuries per year in the United States. Uh, sobering part of that is that our birth rate in the United States is also roughly about 4 million. Uh, this does not count other ways that children are exposed to uh, head injuries, uh, uh, perhaps um, um, a disciplining uh, irate parent who slaps a child that creates rotational movement that can in fact produce a concussion. Uh, those uh, one would suspect are largely unreported. Um, recovery generally is fairly quick, usually within anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Some will persist to two weeks, even perhaps out to six weeks, um, but roughly about 20% seem to persist uh, beyond that time. Next slide, please. Um, this is a slide just on some data that we have under review, but it'll give you sort of a sense. These are data recorded uh, using uh, brain electrical activity. So basically we have a, a, a net of 256 electrodes that fits on the head in about 10 seconds or so. And uh, we present a series, in this case, a series of numbers, one number at a time. All the college uh, athletes had to do was simply say whether the number they currently see matches or does not match a number that occurred two positions earlier. And on the uh, left side, those orbits, those uh, circles you see, the colored circles, on the left uh, for match and non-match, those are um, images of the brain electrical activity on the scalp recorded from those uh, electrodes between 200 and 400 milliseconds. So two tenths to four tenths of a second after the uh, number appears. Uh, so the, um, the schematic on the right shows you the head position. So it's a very rapid uh, brain response. For those athletes who have no history of concussion, we see a very clear difference in the electrical activity uh, for the match versus the mismatch. A lot of yellow and green in the top left uh, orb, and in the bottom we see uh, red and various shades of uh, blue from the front of the head to the uh, back of the head. On the right, though, these are individuals who have a concussion history of one to two years earlier, not current. And yet, uh, at 200 to 400 milliseconds, the brains cannot discriminate um, whether those uh, two numbers are the same or different. Uh, they ultimately get these tasks correct, but it takes them roughly 200 milliseconds longer. That's 20 synapses. So the processing speed is slow. And after two years, one might suspect that's a permanent change. Um, uh, next slide, I think that, yeah, so in terms of critical scientific gaps, some of these uh, redo what Dr. Graham talked about, um, you know, how does concussion affect the brain in the short and long term? We really don't have much information about that. What's the dose requirement? Dr. Uh, Graham talked about that to con uh, uh, produce a concussion, post-concussion syndrome, uh, CTE. How can we reliably, objectively detect when the brain is injured when, and when, importantly, it's fully recovered? Uh, we have no ways to do that. Lots of individual differences from one person to the next. We think there are genetic factors involved, but there could also be a concussion history. The person may not really think they have. How many of us have bumped our head getting in and out of a car? So we have a, a quick rotational movement, and that could produce perhaps that concussion. Um, and then how does the brain recover from TBI? Um, and then finally, how can we uh, improve and recover, uh, accelerate recovery? We really have no uh, scientific basis for any of our interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnston. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Terry, uh, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today alongside this illustrious panel about our experience in Alabama Following Could you pull the microphone a little closer? Is that better? Is that better? Um, following uh, our experience in Alabama, following the passage of concussion legislation, as well as the work we are currently doing at the University of Alabama Birmingham to improve sports safety, as in the state of Nebraska, youth sports and youth football 
uh, are an extremely important part of our culture, and as a result, we take the safety of our children very seriously as well. Um, as well known to the committee, the problem of concussion has gained prominence over the past decade thanks to important research and advocacy work done by scientists, physicians, and in public health professionals at many centers across the United States and through the work of public officials uh, highlighting this research. Of significant concern, recent studies have identified potential long-term health consequences, including depression, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and other neurodegenerative diseases associated with repeated impacts. While college and professional football gets the most media attention, it is important to keep in mind that greater than 70 percent of all football players in the U.S. are under 14 years of age. Any effort directed at improving safety in football and other impact sports will need to address these youth athletes. Parallel to enactment of Alabama's concussion law in 2011, as in many states, uh, the Alabama C State Concussion Task Force, Children's of Alabama, and Think First Alabama initiated a statewide concussion education and awareness program, and it worked. Uh, in that first year, we observed a 500 percent increase in referral of youth athletes referred to the concussion clinic at Children's of Alabama, uh, a trend that has held steady since that time with about 350 uh, youth athletes seen every year. To optimize care of this rapidly increasing patient population, we developed a multidisciplinary protocol uh, is in my Appendix 1. Uh, following the Zurich Consensus Guidelines, athletes were evaluated by physicians with expertise in concussion, kept out of sports or school until symptom-free, referred for neuropsychological testing when appropriate, uh, and supervised in a graduate return to play and a return to think program. A formal study performed in 2012 demonstrated that establishing this program resulted in significantly better concussion care and decreased institutional resource utilization. Even though these efforts have certainly resulted in improved recognition and treatment of concussion in Alabama and in other states, we believe that much remains to be done in order to prevent sports-related brain injury in the first place. Given the difficulty of delineating a specific concussion threshold, as has been said previously, uh, using existing helmet accelerometer technology and other subjective ways of evaluating athletes, researchers have begun to widen their focus from concussion to correlating cumulative impact exposure over time with changes in advanced MR imaging techniques and neuropsychological changes, uh, even in the absence of clinically diagnosed concussion. Animal models of subconcussive impacts have also demonstrated problems with complex spatial learning, cognitive impairment, uh, and, and as is seen also in football players, uh, compared with single impact controls and those who have not had these injuries. Though definitive conclusions about threshold for impact frequency uh, hit counts cannot be drawn from these early studies, it has become clear that subconcussive impacts, that is, those impacts that don't result in concussion, also play a role in cumulative brain injury over time and need to be studied. Recent studies of youth players by researchers at Wake Forest uh, suggest that a significant portion of young players' head impact actually uh, takes place during practices, and the largest impacts happen to take place during those practices a lot of times doing outdated drills like Oklahoma drill or bull in the ring that are supervised by well-meaning but untrained coaches. Uh, emulating top-level collegiate programs, which don't do these uh, practices and these drills, uh, teams like the University of Alabama, Ivy League, and others, uh, the Alabama High School Athletic Association recently published non-binding guidelines to limit full contact hitting practices to twice per week. I believe this type of intervention is complementary to the stuff that USA Football is talking about, about techniques not just the techniques of hitting, but also the number of hitting practices per week, as well as what drills are going to be done during practice. Uh, Pop Warner has instituted similar guidelines to this, but again, that's a small section. Eliminating the frequency of hitting practices, as well as the type of drills, uh, would have a large effect on safety, significantly decreasing the cumulative impact exposure for every youth football player in America. It has also become clear that football helmet standards, currently defined by the National Operating Committee for Standards and Athletic Equipment, must be updated to reflect our improved understanding of the etiologies of concussion. Um, it is clear that both linear impact and rotational acceleration play a role in concussion pathophysiology, and only linear impact is studied by the NOXA system, which was from a skull fracture tolerance model developed in the 1960s. Uh, we believe that having multiple uh, other, uh, the, a more complete picture of the impacts that are seen in the football field are necessary in order to come up with meaningful standards. In collaboration with the University of Alabama football program, engineers at UAB, led by Dean Sicking, previously at the University of Nebraska, and the developer of the Safer Barrier for NASCAR and IRL, have recently developed a robust video analysis system uh, to analyze impacts and then recreate them in a, a purpose-built lab. In conclusion, the passage of concussion awareness legisla legislation, community education, and recent advances in our understanding of head impact exposure in youth athletes have all improved the overall safety of impact sports and that we are recognizing concussions more frequently However, much work remains specifically in concussion education and drafting of policies to limit head impact exposure for youth athletes in contact sports. As part of this 
approach to the uh, multifaceted approach to a complex problem, I believe the development of new helmet standards is also crucial for the development of safer helmets. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Gay. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Terry. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. I'm speaking to you as a football fan who happens to be a physicist. My main professional interest in the game is the understanding of how protective equipment works and how it can be improved. Today I wish to consider several aspects of football that are problematic as far as concussions go and how we might move forward to make the game safer. American football is an inherently violent sport. That's one of the reasons we love it. That's one of the, the, the forces encountered in football can be huge. Consider a big hit between a running back and a linebacker at full speed. We can show using Newton's second law that the force each player exerts on the other exceeds three quarters of a ton. This is why football is called a contact sport. Two players who collide at full speed, helmet to helmet, are experiencing the same force to their heads that one of them would feel if he had a 16 pound bowling ball dropped on his helmet from a height of eight feet. Medical knowledge of concussions is in its infancy, but we know one thing for sure, forces to the head and neck cause concussions, and we've just, how, we've just heard how big these forces can be. Here's another problem, they're getting bigger. Since 1920, the average weight of pro linemen has increased almost 60% to just over 300 pounds. At the same time, these players have gotten about 10% faster. Combining the factors of speed and mass to calculate kinetic energy, the energy available to cause injury, we find that the amount of energy dumped into the pit at the line of scrimmage on any given play has almost doubled since 1920. In exact opposition to this trend is the fact that players are shedding their protective gear. Thigh and knee pads that used to be centimeters thick now bear a remarkable resemblance to teacup doilies. Horse collars, popular with linemen of my generation, have gone the way of the flying wedge. Modern football helmets are technological marvels, but players choose them not for their collision cushioning ability, but for how cool they look. Another problem is the poor state of our medical knowledge. While I'm not competent to explain these issues, I think it's safe to say that a room full of head trauma physicians will not agree on the details of what concussions are or what causes them. This means that the diagnosis and treatment of concussions has a long way to go. As our understanding of these issues improve, we may find that injury rates due to the increasing energy of the game and the wholesale shedding of equipment have increased faster than we thought. Finally, football is big business, especially at the college and professional levels. When monetary forces manifest themselves as they do in, for example, bounty programs and illegal doping to improve performance, the game becomes more dangerous. What are the solutions? We need better equipment, but this can get tricky. For example, it's apparent that adding more energy absorbing foam to the outside of a helmet will lower the force delivered to a player's skull. This has been tried in the past. The problem is that the added padding increases the helmet diameter as well as its coefficient of friction, meaning that the op opposing player can exert a lot more torque on your head. Nonetheless, Several companies today are proposing the same basic padding idea for youth football, for whose players the risk of collisions to the head is almost certainly greater. The use of the STAR system for rating helmets and the HIT system for monitoring collisions to a player's head represent important first steps toward improving football safety. For a variety of reasons that disregard player safety, they're largely ignored. Our understanding of the physiological and epidemiological issues related to concussions must be improved. There is now an understanding in the NFL and at the college level that significant research in this area is needed. Several of the members of this panel, including my colleague from Nebraska, Dr. Mulfees, are leading cutting edge efforts in this area. Finally, some incremental rule changes and more stringent enforcement of existing rules are needed. In my opinion, some of the new rules regarding targeting, peel back blocking and definition of a defenseless, oppo a defenseless opponent are making players more hesitant on the field. These rules may thus actually increase the risk of injury. Rule changes should be studied and possibly reversed. It is my belief that a return to the level of padding worn in the 1970s would make the game significantly safer. More thorough doping rules should be developed 
and actually enforced. The NFL season should be reduced to 14 games and the college season returned to 11. Finally, more stringent requirements regarding when a player with a concussion can return to the game need to be implemented. These are my thoughts for your consideration. Thank you for your attention and your valuable time. Thank you for your valuable time. And uh, Dr. Joya, I appreciate you being here. You were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman uh, Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of the safety of our children in this country. So I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist at Children's National Health System here in Washington, D.C., and the director of the SCORE concussion program. I'm a clinician, a researcher, and a public health educator. Today I'd like to take my time to focus my comments on the importance of public health education for youth concussion using my expertise as a clinician and a researcher. And I've worked for uh, the last decade with the CDC on their Heads Up uh, concussion program materials. We all know, and I think Ian uh, said it just perfectly, that sports and recreation provide important developmental opportunities uh, to enrich the lives of our youth. They teach life lessons. But we have to balance those incredible benefits of sports participation with careful attention to safety issues. And science must drive our action-oriented approach. Concussions are serious injuries to the brain that threaten the development of our youth. In an attempt to protect our youth, we now have laws in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, all with the good intent of protecting our student athletes through rules for educating coaches and parents and removing suspected concussions and not allowing them to return until properly cleared. All states, including, uh, uh, include the high school at this level, but only 15 out of those 51 include youth sports. So less than one third are looking at the, the majority of athletes. In preparing for this testimony, I was posed with a, an important question and challenge within youth sports. With concussion awareness now at an all-time high, are youth sports teams and organizations and parents more aware but still not sure what to do about it? And the simple answer to that question with my experience is yes. Many coaches and parents are not equipped to know what to do with a suspected concussion. Mechanisms to teach active recognition and response to every coach and parent are inconsistent and limited in scope. The health and safety of youth athletes is largely in the hands of coaches and parents at the youth level. They need medically guided training in early identification of concussion and protection. Coaches and parents must receive training in action-oriented concussion recognition and response. Awareness isn't enough and they'd have to be prepared properly. We know that, as you've heard, repeated concussions present the greatest challenge to our, our youth. So our greatest challenge is really the universal consistent and effective implementation of these 51 laws so that we can prepare those coaches and, and parents to know what to do and have the tools with which to do it. At Children's National Health System over the past 10 years, our SCORE program has delivered hundreds upon hundreds of action-oriented parent and coach concussion education and training programs using the heads up uh, materials from the CDC. We've learned much about the community needs and how to deliver the message. So we deliver scenario-based training where we present to coaches and parents an actual situation and what they must do to recognize and respond. This is all very, very important as we uh, put these responsible adults in, in, uh, in place. You've heard about some important other kinds of activities uh, and good examples of head safe action, head smart action, such as USA Football's Heads Up Tackling Program, where coaches are educated in concussion recognition and response, but also taught techniques that we believe can improve taking the head out of the game. But we have to go further in all youth sports. We do not have a coordinated universal strategy at this point for action-oriented, solution-driven methods to recognize and respond to these injuries. We have the tools, we have many of the programs, but we do not at this point have the delivery mechanism to do that. So we have to build also on active partnerships between youth sports organizations and medical care systems. Concussions are complicated, they are not simple. We're not asking parents and coaches to be clinicians and to go out and diagnose. 
We have willing teammates, as you've heard, through USA Football, US Lacrosse, USA Hockey, USA Rugby, and other organizations. But we need to build those partnerships. We need the help of the professional sports leagues, as you're hearing from the NHL and the NFL and the sports manufacturing world, to team with us. We also need a quarterback, ultimately, to make this happen. We have to leverage the efforts of other organizations like the National Council on Youth Sports Safety, the Youth Sports Safety Alliance, the Sarah Jane Brain Foundation's PABI plan. All of this is important for us to do. So we need, obviously, funding to do that to move forward. Can we move from awareness to action? Yes, we can. Concussions are serious injuries that threaten our youth, but we do not need to be scared away from that. We do not need to avoid developmentally appropriate participation in, uh, in sports activities. What we need to do is focus on how to teach recognition and response, and our country needs a good universal mechanism to implement community-focused youth concussion solutions. And we believe that that can help children ultimately as they enjoy the benefits of sports. Our, our score motto applies here. It says, play hard, play safe, but play smart. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Shenton, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Um, thank you. Um, I want to thank Chairman Terry, uh, Ranking Member Ch um, Chikowski, and members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here today. Uh, my focus is going to be on radiological evidence of both um, concussion and subconcussive um, blows to the head. And if I could have the next slide. Um, what is known is that mild traumatic brain injury is common in sports injury. And when we're talking about a single mild TBI, about 80% get better. Uh, between 15 and 30% go on to have persistent um, concussive symptoms as have been described today. Um, what's most concerning, though, are what's been called chronic traumatic encephalopathy and other neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and that's the second one, um, where it's repetitive mild traumatic brain injury that we're really concerned with. And the clearest evidence comes from postmortem studies. If I could have the next slide. Uh, here's a postmortem slide. This is Ann McKee's work that shows tau protein in the brain. And those are the brown areas that show up. And this is in a case of a retired professional football player who had symptoms um, and was presumed to have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which was confirmed at postmortem. Next slide, please. Now, here are four individuals, A, B, C, and D. What's interesting here, and this is work by Goldstein, it shows that blast injury and repetitive brain trauma look the same at postmortem. So we have a military person at 45 with one closed range blast injury, uh, a 34-year-old with two blast injuries, an amateur football player at the age of 18 with repetitive concussions, and then a 21-year-old with subconcussive blows to the head only. Next slide, please. So what is known? Uh, we've gone over the first two. The third is mild TBI is very difficult to diagnose, and that's been a really serious problem because if you use conventional CT and conventional MRI, you are not likely to find differences or abnormalities in the brain. And so many people have said there's no problem then. Uh, the problem is the correct advanced tools have not been used until more recently. And um, now with advanced neuroimaging, we're able to both diagnose and move towards prognosis and hopefully intervention. Uh, advanced neuroimaging techniques such as diffusion imaging, uh, which we've been using in our laboratory, show radiological evidence of brain alterations in living individuals with mild TBI. And so if we can detect this early and we can perhaps then look at underlying mechanisms and characterize um, what's going on in order to uh, come up with preventative measures. Next slide, please. So this is a study from our group looking at hockey players from university hockey players in Canada. And the bottom line is over on the right. Um, the first is at preseason, and the second is at postseason. The red dots are three individuals who had concussion during play from preseason to postseason. And the increase is increase in um, extracellular water in the brain, um, which is not a good sign. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we also looked at gray matter, looking at cortical thinning in the brain, and that's the cortex where neurons are in the brain. And this is a study in former professional football players who were symptomatic when we looked at them. 
And um, what we found was that there's cortical thinning compared to age-matched normal control. What's most concerning, however, is that blue line that shows that the cortical thinning accelerates with age, whereas the red line, our control group, where it's almost completely flat. And this suggests that cortical thinning may indicate abnormal aging and a risk for dementia that we can see right now in living individuals. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is a study that we did in Germany with elite um, uh, soccer players. And we selected them specifically for not having a history of concussion and not having any symptoms whatsoever. And what we found was compared to sw um, swimmers, professional swimmers, there was a huge difference between the two groups with the controls on the left and the soccer players on the right, almost a complete separation between the two groups with um, an increase in what's called radial diffusivity, which is a measure of uh, damage to myelin in the brain. Uh, next slide, please. So what we don't know, um, why do concussive and subconcussive trauma resolve in some and not in others? Um, another question we don't know is why do some develop neurodegenerative disease while others do not? What are the predisposing factors? Um, is it exposure? Are genetics involved? Because not every football player, not every soccer player, um, not every hockey player who plays and gets hit to the head ends up with these neurodegenerative um, diseases, which is what I think people are most concerned with. Um, and next slide. So what we need is diagnosis to detect brain injury early. We have imaging tools now that are sensitive, widely available, and can be applied in vivo. Prognosis to follow recovery and degenerative processes. So we need to follow recovery and degenerative processes in order to predict who will have a poor outcome and who will have um, a, a good outcome. And knowing that, we might be able to intercede with treatment to halt the possible cascade of neurodegenerative changes. And finally, um, just in summary, next slide. Uh, sports concussion leads to alterations of the brain's white and gray matter. Advanced neuroimaging is sensitive to detect brain at alterations following concussion and subconcussive brain trauma. And the impact over time in is important. We need longitudinal studies to identify different stages of recovery and being able to pick out ahead of time um, what is going to lead to a poor outcome so that we can intercede. And finally, some measures of safety, such as rules for returning to play, are needed following observable evidence of brain trauma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very impressive testimony from everyone, and I was even impressed that you all stuck to the five minutes pretty close. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to go back to Dr. Malfees because I think your testimony and, and, and Dr. Shenton's uh, kind of juxtapose each other here very nicely. So part of what your research is doing is finding that baseline of uh, the new athletes that enter uh, University of Nebraska. So you're de is this allowing you to detect the injuries earlier uh, that there may have been some pre-existing uh, sub-concussion? How, do how are you identifying that? Uh, what is it telling you, and what are you then, what, what is the university doing uh, to implement some level of protections? Uh, well, one of the major changes we've seen, and I think this is uh, occurring across the field now, is the effort to get pre-concussion data. So basically more and more schools are moving to uh, assess uh, student athletes prior to the start of the season. Then, uh, and that certainly is what we're doing. And then should a uh, player be injured and they're identified through uh, trainers or the medical team. Uh, one of the uh, weaknesses here is that the players do not always uh, self-identify. And uh, so we've run across that a number of times in our testing of we'll pick up something on our test. The trainers and the medical team didn't know about simply because the, the player didn't uh, disclose. Um, and uh, then we also try to test somebody else who plays a similar position and, uh, uh, but has not been injured and they act sort of as a, a game control over the course of a season. And generally what we're finding is both effects uh, that occur across the season and just our normal players who have no history of concussion being identified, their, their brain speed of processing does change over the uh, four to five months of training and, and the season. 
but then with the uh, players who are who do experience a concussion, we see uh, in terms of brain electrical activity, again, this slowdown of about uh, 200 milliseconds. That's four times faster than the slowdown you see in multiple sclerosis, for an example, for a, a contrast. So clearly the brain has changed the way it's processing. Uh, we're just now moving to start intervention programs with the players that we identify. Uh, there's some data out there with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, early Alzheimer's, that suggests uh, working memory type task may uh, uh, even a week of intervention shows a four to five week uh, gain, continual gain in improvement. And so we're trying to see if uh, we can see some of that occurring. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gay, uh, in regard to concussion, so many times it's not a direct blow, but coup contra coup, it's being hit so that the head is going back and forth and the brain is sloshing around. Uh, you mentioned going back to seven, 1970s type of equipment, and uh, Tom Osborne likes to talk about the neck roll. That uh, w Describe to me what you mean by 1970s equipment and how it may actually reduce concussions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, the, the neck roll, what I call the horse collar, is, is really uh, a piece of equipment that's, that's disappeared from the game, and it, it does an important thing. It, it essentially immobilizes the head. So if concussions are concurred by the rattling of the brain back and forth, especially from a blow to the side, uh, the, the, the uh, horse collar will substantially damp that down. To my knowledge, there, is, there are no epidemiological studies of, of, of that being effective, but I, I just can't, my personal opinion, even though I'm ignorant of, largely ignorant of medical science, is that if you immobilize the head, uh, that's going to solve a lot of the problems, especially with these rotational hits. Um, yeah. Dr. Graham, does that make sense? I think uh, whether or not the horse collar would have that effect, I don't know. And, and of course, our committee was based purely on science and you know reviewing the literature. But I think the principle is you want to find ways to minimize the linear and rotational forces that come into effect with a blow to the head. And whether you can do that by equipment, uh, whether you can do that by change in play, you know, that's what you have to do to, to decrease the evidence of the incidence of concussion. Thank you. Uh, I only have 11 seconds, so after I'll yield back and recognize the uh, ranking member, Ms. Schakowsky. You know, in addition to the science, um, so much talk has been about culture, um, and it, it seems to me that that is very important. Um, so a change in the culture means not only managing head injuries when they occur, but also encouraging safer play to reduce the risk of head injuries. So Mr. Heaton, um, you spoke about the need to change the, uh, quoting from your testimony, the win at all costs attitude among players and coaches. Um, what would you tell teams to help them change that attitude, both within themselves and teammates and perhaps more challenging in, in coaches. Thank you. Uh, well, frankly, I would actually encourage the coaches to stress this as much as possible, as well as the parents, because the coaches and the parents are there to help us learn how to play these sports correctly. And if they can emphasize uh, not having to worry about winning to the point where you get hurt, then it'll trickle down to the players, and the players become coaches, and then it's this never-ending cycle of teaching and making sure that the players know that winning is not the most important thing. It's, it, you know, it feels great to win, but I'd much rather lose than have another concussion. Clearly you were aware because of the severe consequences of the brain, brain injury, but do you think that um, youth athletes understand what those symptoms are? Yes, I think it's getting better indeed, especially at my school. I mean, they're... You know, we emphasize uh, making sure that you know the symptoms of concussions. And I feel like it's spreading as well. Um, let me, but let me ask Dr. Uh, Joy of that. Too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, 
Certainly at this point, uh, the education programs are also being directed toward the athletes. And, and quite honestly, uh, about five years ago, maybe six years ago, there was a study that showed that um, that was the number one reason why athletes were not coming out of the game because they didn't know how to tie together the symptomatology. It wasn't simply that they didn't want to lose playing time, but they didn't know what they were dealing with in the, themselves. Right. But we also believe that athletes and teammates need to watch out for each other because the concussed athlete themselves may not have the wherewithal to know that they aren't right, and yet their teammate right next to them oftentimes does. So there's a responsibility within that team to take care of each other, and that's an important focus. And that gets to culture as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Shenton, uh, please explain a little bit how advanced neuroimaging works and describe the types of changes in the brain your lab is able to detect that traditional Im imaging can't and also some of the types of neuroimaging used by your lab have been a, a significant part of the research on diseases like Alzheimer's and schizophrenia. Why are the same inter imaging techniques appropriate for research on these diseases and research on sports-related brain Okay, um, I have a slide um, which is just at the end of my slides that just explains um, in one slide diffusion imaging, which I think would um, help out here. The one, I, um, the one slide I really didn't understand, was, did, was it comparing swimmers with... Uh, with the soccer players, players. but I was going to go, go through ahead. and just um, okay. show you why um, diffuse axonal injury is important um, because um, the injury that happens in um, the impact to the brain is generally a stretching of the cables in the brain, which is really the white matter. And it's, um, for example, the corpus callosum is the largest white matter track in the brain. And so you get shearing. And this doesn't show up on um, traditional CT or MRI. In fact, the first mild TBI conference I went to, no one showed a brain. And I looked to my colleague, and I said, why would no one show a brain? And he said, because everyone knows that you can't see anything on the brain. And I said, but um, th nobody's using the right tools here. And this is just a very simple principles of diffusion imaging. If you look on the left, this is ink that goes on a Kleenex. It goes in all directions. And that's called isotropic diffusion. If you look on the right, it says anisotropic diffusion. So you're dropping ink on newspaper. And newspaper has fibers, so it restricts the water. And this is the same principle that's used quantitatively to look at the brain. So that if you're in CSF, it's very round. And it's, um, a a it's isotropic. The, the, the everything goes in the same direction. If you're looking at white matter, you're restricted in two directions. And so you can measure how, uh, what the integrity is of white matter fiber bundles in the brain. And that's what you need to look at in mild TBI. Now, if you have someone come in with a moderate or severe brain injury, you don't, you don't need this kind sure. of technology. They're going to just be put into neurosurgery, and they're going to do an operation. It's these very subtle brain injuries that aren't recognized using conventional imaging, um, where you can recognize it if you use something like diffusion imaging. And we've shown over and over again now that you can see, um, and it's not just our group, starting in 2003, people started using diffusion imaging because it's the most sensitive imaging tool that exists today to look at diffuse axonal injury, which is the major injury in mild TBI. So what needs to be done now is to look at acute injury and see what predicts outcome, like do acute injury at 72 hours, at three months, at six months. Can we then predict, knowing that, what happens at 72 hours um, if you have a, um, we have someone in our lab that's trying to separate um, water that's outside the brain, versus outside cells versus in cells. If you can predict from 72 hours, then you can go back and say, okay, maybe we want to put in um, anti-inflammatory medications if this is a neuroinflammatory response. We don't know enough right now. The only way to know is to do these longitudinal studies um, and follow over time using very sophisticated imaging technology, um, in my opinion. Once you know, you can diagnose. Once you diagnose... So this, this could be very promising yeah. not only for our athletes but our returning veterans and yes. applied eventually to uh, schizophrenia or Alzheimer's. Oh, actually, we've applied it. I'm 
primarily schizophrenia research. That's okay. what I'd done for 30 years before I became a, a TBI researcher in 2008. Um, and we have a measure of called free water based on imaging, this kind of imaging, that shows that early on at the very first episode of schizophrenia, you see fluid around all of the brain um, that's free water. It's, it's like um, the isotropic. Uh, but in just the frontal lobe, you see it more um, restricted to tissue, inside tissue. Um, and this is a brand new um, technique that was developed by um, a Fulbright scholar that's in our lab from Israel. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to have okay. to say and thank you because it's uh, very prominent. Two and a half Thank minutes. you. Yes, thank you. Uh, gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Uh, Johnston, um, you stated that many sports-related concussions still go undiagnosed, and I'd like to know why, in your opinion, that is the case, and how can we improve that in our state laws, and also uh, the involvement of coaches and players and PTAs, uh, uh, areas where we need to have improvement. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think I would echo what has been said by others on the panel. It's on. It's on. Sorry. I would echo what's uh, been said by others on the panel that um, I think that a lot of it has to do with recognition. Obviously, people are very good at recognizing when someone gets knocked out on the field, but of course, that's a very small percentage of all concussions. And I think that as our understanding of all the various symptoms that can go with concussion um, have uh, uh, arisen, uh, it becomes uh, incumbent upon us to improve the quality of the education that we give to our coaches, uh, players, trainers, um, officials about the symptoms of concussion. Um, uh, I think that that's the main reason. I, I, my sense is that in general, the culture, uh, at least speaking for the state of Alabama, that uh, m all the coaches that I have come into contact are believers. They're not, you know, purposefully hiding, you know, kids and putting them back in knowing they have concussions. But I think that sometimes it's hard to, to recognize, especially when, when uh, young athletes don't tell you how they're feeling and other issues, uh, which I guess were brought up with the importance of teammates being involved with uh, diagnosing these players so they can be pulled and appropriately evaluated. Uh, how close, in your opinion, are we to uh, a better design for helmets? I think that, um, uh, that we are at the very beginning. I think that we have been using a standard that has not changed for 40 years that was designed for skull fractures. Yes. Um, that has served its purpose. And I think that many... Uh, Investigators around are working to improve the quality of the standards to in include linear and rotational acceleration as well as other uh, important aspects of, of impacts. And just like the automotive industry did 30 years ago with um, once you start ranking cars with safety ratings, the market can be relied upon for manufacturers to improve their helmet designs to uh, improve their sales. So I think that's, that's the stage we're at. I think standards are an important uh, part of the, the equation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gay, in your testimony, uh, uh, you've discussed the fact that uh, there is a numerical rating system for a helmet's impact. I think it's uh, designed at uh, Virginia Tech, the STAR system, uh, and you have called it uh, the best tool we have for analyzing the merits of various helmet systems. Can you briefly explain how the numerical scoring system works? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, Basically, it uh, involves a test where you drop the helmet uh, from a given height, uh, a, a varying height, uh, uh, to the side, to the front, to the back. It tries to uh, simulate the kinds of impacts that a football player would actually experience, and numerical scores are given to the maximum acceleration that the noxy head inside the helmet feels. Uh, for these for these given drops, based on a, f in my opinion, fairly crude initial model of what causes concussions, there is no effect to take into account rotation. There is no effect of temperature, uh, and in my opinion, the, um, the the reproducibility is not as good as one would would like. Having tried to do uh, examples of these kinds of tests um, uh, in groups that I've been involved with, so so. I think, it's, I think it's a good first start. It's the best we have right now. I think it needs to be paid attention to, but there's a lot of room, a lot of room for improvement. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gay. And, and uh, finally, Ian, uh, how old are you and what grade are you in? I'm 18 and I'm a senior. And does that mean you'll be going off to college in the autumn? 
Yes, and I will. Do you know yet where you will be attending college? Uh, I'm going to Elon University in North Carolina. In North Carolina. My congratulations to you and my condolences to your parents on the uh, <laughs> cost of higher education in this country. It's a great <laughs> school. I have a uh, goddaughter who is a freshman there. That means she's a little older than you, but I'll be happy to introduce you <laughs> to her. <laughs> <laughs> and let me say I am very proud of your testimony and I could not have done what you have just done when I was 17 or 18 and certainly I think the nation uh, has benefited by your outstanding testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen from Mississippi, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for uh, being here and sharing your expertise on uh, what is a, a topic that we're really just I think only really learning uh, about is it's been uh, in the news for uh, several years, but it is, I think, coming to the forefront and your work and your information, your testimony on the record here today, I think will be beneficial to us. Uh, as a uh, uh, parent of a 24-year-old young man with Fragile X Syndrome, I particularly appreciate the work that you do at the Children's uh, Hospital, you, Dr. Joya, you, Dr. Johnston. Uh, but this is, uh, in, in preparation for this, I had some discussion with some parents back home, uh, and, it, and the, the, the interesting discussion is I had several friends who uh, have uh, daughters playing youth soccer, and they, the number of them reported an increase in the number of concussions uh, suffered by young ladies playing uh, youth soccer. Uh, you know, we, we seemed in the news to always associate it with the uh, NFL and helmet-to-helmet uh, -helmet contact and concussions and things that we see on the, on the field of play. Uh, but it, it's, it appears in every, everything we do in life, every sporting uh, event, there's that, that danger and that risk. That's why I think what you're doing uh, with the uh, Think First Alabama, Dr. Johnson, is the preventive part of it is how do we educate uh, our players and coaches uh, parents, uh, and uh, and perhaps if the using the teammate approach, it may be the the safest thing may be to have the backup position player be the one to report for the uh, first teamer <laughs> when they need to come out. You know that might uh, uh, get them off the field. But but thank each of you for your work and Dr. Johnson, uh, educate us a little bit on what is a subconcussive impact. What does that mean? And how important is that when addressing concussion diagnoses? And should subconcussive impacts affect rules of game and play? And if so, how? Um, yeah, so uh, I think that the, the definition of a subconcussive impact would be all those other, the 99.9% .9 of impacts that